soon. No looking in the chat to see if someone marked the timestamp of when this begins. None of that bullshit. We're here. We're starting. We're on time. We're just getting into it. Okay? We are just getting right the hell into it, folks. How's everybody in the chat doing? I'm going to give y'all a little bit of time off the jump to get yourself settled. Um, tell yourself a nice little like peaceful mantra to get you calm. Whatever we need to do to find some modicum of peace during this stream. Because the stuff we're going to cover today, it's, it's pretty serious. It's serious. It's unfortunate. I'm not skipping these ads. Ah, oh, I forgot about that. I forgot that's a thing. I also have to give you guys time to settle in past the ads now that I'm monetized. I'm still getting used to that. It's still so strange for me to like go and click on one of my videos and see an ad. I'm, I'm not used to that myself. <laughs> but I appreciate you guys dealing with the ads as that all helps this channel grow, as I'm sure you understand. I will definitely be doing my part to minimize the amount of that, though. Um, I'm very particular with, like, my brand deals and such, for examples. So you're never going to see me, like, spouting off on just some bullshit brand. <laughs> it's going to be stuff that I either, like, genuinely use or not at all. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I'm sure that you could tell from the preview of the live today, what we are going to be talking about is the extremely depressing phenomenon of how often fathers are murdered at very basic custody exchanges. I cannot even count the amount of cases that I've covered like this, but the one that this case that we're going to be covering today in particular reminds me so much of is a little over a year ago now, I covered the shooting death of a father named Chad Reed. Now, if you do not remember that situation by any chance, um, here's a little refresher. Chad is the man in the teal that we see here, and his murderer, Kyle Carruth, is in black. Now, in this situation, which happened at the end of 2021, fall of 2021, like right before Thanksgiving break, um, Father Chad Reed was going to pick up his son from a very routine custody exchange um, at their agreed upon location at the agreed upon time. Now, due to the conflicts that had been going on in this relationship, I'm sure many of you who are divorced or share custody are very familiar with these time, these types of contentious relationships. So due to the fact that there had already been a lot of issues, the new wife of Chad had begun to record the interaction at which Chad went to go pick up his son as soon as she realized that Chad was not going to be getting his son. When he arrived at the location, which, by the way, was one of many locations they checked trying to locate the son, it was clear that the mother in this situation had been withholding the child and was attempting to hide the child, essentially, right? You can't pick up your child if the child is not at the pickup location. Um, and from what I've heard from Chad Reed's daughters, they have both said that this was pretty frequent and common for Chad's ex-wife to kind of hide their son so that he couldn't pick him up, either at family members or what have you. Um, we've had this happen to us in the past, so I obviously believe that it does happen. So this was about the third or fourth location, and this was the location that his ex-wife owned as a property that she was sharing with her new, wasn't even the husband, the boyfriend, Kyle Carruth, as kind of a business office. So they arrive, and Kyle comes out. Now what we've learned is that the son was there, but he is hidden. Who knows, though, how much of this he saw. Kyle comes out, refusing to hand over the son. Chad gets understandably aggressive 
I don't know if you or I would have done the same exact thing in the situation, but Chad got in Kyle's face, kind of puffing out his chest. It was definitely a show of strength, I guess you would say. Um, and Kyle did not take too kindly to this, telling Chad repeatedly to get off the property or else. And that or else apparently meant Kyle going back inside and getting out a gun. Chad still did not back down as he did not have his son yet, which was the prime obje objective there. Kyle threatened Chad with a warning shot in the ground at his feet, which I don't know if you know this. I did not know this until this case, and I am now aware of it. Firing a warning shot is not legal. That is not considered a valid thing to do. Um, you're not exactly allowed to, like, threaten people off your property with a warning shot. Um, that's not legal. But that's what he does, and you see it on the footage, uh, which I'm not, I'm not going to play it here today. This is just a lead-up case to what we're going to be talking about. Um, it's at this point that Chad begins to react by attempting to take away the gun, this can be interpreted many different ways. For some, they may say, well, it's natural that if someone's trying to take away your gun, that means they're going to use it against you. For others, they're saying, well, it's natural that if someone's using a gun to threaten you, that you would try to eliminate that threat by taking the gun away. I will say, having unfortunately a very close experience with being in a situation where you are attempting to wrestle away a weapon first from someone, no one, everyone is in survival mode at that point. For me, when it happened, I was being threatened with a knife. I took the knife away, and that person's response immediately was to grab the knife back from me and stab me. Sorry to talk about knife violence. I should have put a trigger warning, but quite frankly, it's a true crime channel, so if you didn't expect to hear about gore, that's kind of a user error. Um... But when it happened to me, I think we were all shocked by the situation. You don't really know how you're going to react in such a survival situation. But typically by the point that you're fighting over a weapon, someone will get hurt. And that's exactly what happened. Because as soon as Kyle Carruth was able to wrestle the gun back from Chad, he point blank fired directly in his chest, killing him within minutes. The outcome of this case was that no arrests were made. It was considered just one big accident. Um, the mother of Chad's son and Kyle Carruth took the son, left for vacation, which was supposed to be Chad's half of the Thanksgiving break, but they went and took him on a trip. It was all smiles and laughs. They did not keep in contact at all with Chad's ex or anything like that. And in the end, Kyle Kruth faced no justice for what occurred. It was all considered just one big tragic accident. And the case that we're covering today, it, it really reminds me of this in many ways. Th this is happening all too often. It would appear as though this was all a setup. What a lot of people who look back on this case look back and think was that Chad was led to his murder, like a lamb is led to the slaughter. Not many people are believing that this incident was just a wild accident, just a fluke, just a flurry of words that got out of hand. Not many people are buying that, especially given the fact that it seemed that Chad was almost lured out there through the withholding of his son. It seemed that they wanted to get Chad on that property in a state that they knew he would be enraged so that they could use that to say, well, he clearly was this aggressive man. Uh, it was also brought up, um, he did have a little bit of a rap sheet, so to say, 
um, some assault charges from like ages ago, like super years ago before his child was even born. And those all got brought up in the case. Everybody painting Chad to be the aggressor, the problem. Well, if Chad wasn't so aggressive, then none of this would have happened. And I really think that the woman involved in today's story probably looked back and saw cases like this and thought, that's a really great idea. Look at this, babe, come in here and look at this case real quick. Isn't this crazy? They were able to get away with murdering this guy and then they get to go take the kid out on their half of the break. This would solve all of our problems. We've been spending so much time fighting in court, wasting our money away, trying to negotiate with this man, when clearly, from what we see historically, we could just off him, then we get full custody, then we, you know, don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And because of our failures in the past to properly bring justice to these people who are clearly just trying to get dad out of the picture because of our failure to reach justice in these past cases we have enabled future criminals to truly and honestly believe that they can get away with this shit this is crazy sapper in the chat actually says i wear body armor to all exchanges with my ex I won't be another Chad Reed. Think about that. We're living in a world where we send our children to school with bulletproof backpacks and where we can't even pick them up from the other parent's house without wearing bulletproof vests. Being a parent is like going to war these days. And a lot of people used to say that jokingly, like, oh, we have to walk through the battlefield of Legos and deal with the the casualties and collateral damage of chocolate milk stains on our favorite white sweaters but no seriously if you're a single father attempting to share custody with your ex you're going to war you're a soldier and the rate at which you may come back alive has significantly decreased due to this newfound job of yours. I'm, it's not even funny anymore. It's true. So with all that being said, let's get right into the story of Jared Bright again. So let's meet our characters of this show, okay? So starting off, this is Jared Bride again. Um, I don't have his exact birthday or anything pulled up, um, but this is going to be the main character of our character of our story. Okay, Jared was married to Shanna Gardner, who is the daughter of Sherry and oh God, what's his name? Sterling Gardner. They are multi-million dollar owners of the company Stampin' Up, which I guess makes, you know, paper, pencil, parchment materials for writers and crafts folk alike. So Shana comes, Shana, Shana, um, quite frankly, I don't personally care how much I'm pronouncing her name right throughout all of this. I'll call her Shanna. Uh, yes, I could have picked a better picture of her. I absolutely could have. Um, don't care to. Shanna and Jared, they met in 2010. Um, and by 2015, they were divorced. They had twin children together, one boy, one girl. And allegedly, the reason for their split was because Shanna was having an affair. Um, let me see if I can actually pull up the article on that. Here we go. 
Yep, it was uh, one Christmas. Jared decided, you know, I'm going to get my wife some personal training sessions. Working out is really important to her. So Jared went ahead and paid for a few sessions with a personal trainer who has since come out anonymously um, to speak to reports and what he came out and said was that the romance between them started almost immediately with Shanna coming on to him saying uh, that apparently she really wasn't talking to Jared anymore. They were growing apart. And the details that this trainer gave, they were very close to details that you really would only know if you were close to Shanna and Jared, which leads me to believe that this person is actually the real trainer and not just somebody who's making up details to get clout. Because one of the things this trainer said was that one of Shanna's biggest complaints about Jared was that Shanna grew up in a Mormon household and Jared was very into the Church of Latter-day Saints. And it was just too much of a similar field for her and Shanna wanted out. And these are details that are true within the religious nature of the family and details that had not been revealed to media yet. So again, this is not the biggest detail in the story necessarily. And this personal trainer does not play any future role. He says that they broke up not too long after as she was dealing with obviously the fallout of her divorce as a result of this. Now, Shanna denies entirely that the affair happened. Her parents, Sherry and Sterling Gardner, the owners of the now to be ashamed company Stampin' Up, also have for some reason felt the need to come out and defend their daughter against these accusations. So I personally am leaning toward, yeah, she probably cheated and that's probably the main reason they got divorced, but of course she's in denial. She's telling a different story. So due to this divorce, it would lead to what would become a highly contested divorce and custody battle with both of them wanting full custody. And I believe I read somewhere that up until the date of Jared's death, which is of course when the custody battle has to end, there were over 800 pages of their collective court paperwork. And according to Jared's widow, Kirsten, um, apparently she, Shanna was just taking them to court for every little thing, constantly just making up lies, wild accusations. And we do hear this stuff all the time. And knowing that Shanna's parents are multi-millionaires, it would make sense that she would have the permanent funds to just keep going to town on Jared like this. Now, Jared was an executive for Microsoft, so he had imaginably a bit of money to throw around himself, but nothing compared to the wealth of the gardeners. So they were really putting it on him. But as of the point that he was murdered, he was still able to keep up the fight as best he could despite the major disparity of wealth between them, and he was able to maintain his 50-50 custody. Thank God. So their agreement, as long as it lasted, was that it would pretty much be week on, week off, with every Wednesday being the opposite parent's date night with the child, where they could take them out for dinner and then return them to whoever had them for the week. So that was about the custody situation, um, but it was still definitely ongoing right up until his passing. Um, all the way up to that, she was still going, going, and trying to get full custody. Um, I believe I could be wrong about this. I haven't seen anything that concretely defines it, but I believe, though, that despite the 50-50, Jared was still paying her child support. Because, again, when, when they're calculating child support, they don't take into account your parents' wealth, right? 
you could come from a family where your parents are worth $50 million and they're giving you obviously as much money as you want. And then you marry a guy worth a hundred K a year and you don't have a job. Guess what? The hundred K a year guy is going to be paying you the dollars. Even if you are ultimately just way out of that guy's tax bracket, as far as how much you can actually afford that genuinely does happen all the time. So moving right through this, they're divorced. Jared goes on to meet his new wife. They have two beautiful children together. Shanna moves on as well. And she is going to meet a gentleman named Mario Fernandez. They meet at a CrossFit gym, very on brand for Shanna. Uh, but Mario is not a personal trainer, uh, not really like licensed, not a bodybuilder. Um, as far as I could tell, absolutely nothing special in any way. Um, pretty much zero accomplishments or achievements or anything to be proud of. Uh, I understand that he was working maintenance, which for many people is an honorable career, um, but I'm pretty sure he probably sucked at it. So this is Mario Fernandez. And just for further context, to put some faces to the names, this is Sherry and Sterling Gardner. Shanna's mother and father, again, the founders of Stampin' Up. So if you see anything from the company Stampin' Up, if you are a parcelist, a lover of writing and ye old snail mail, um, avoid this company at all costs. In fact, if you see anything of theirs, um, feel free to just throw it right in the trash is what I would personally recommend. Um, just because as we get into this, it's really hard for me to believe that these are not the faces of criminals who funded the murder of a father. Again, this is all speculation. This is not, I have no proof to back this up. These are my personal thoughts and opinions um, on that case that these two people are terrible people is my personal opinion. So that's going to bring us into where we're at on the night of, in the month of February, 2022, last year is when we reach our inciting incident, so to say. So it all began when Jared was driving the twins back from his date night, his usual date night on Wednesdays, and he was going to drop them off to Shanna. He does so. They drop off. They say goodbye. He starts driving back home. Now, this particular road that he's driving down, it's, it's later in the evening. It's dark. It's a very isolated road. There's no security cameras down this road. Now, Jared's wife has also made it very clear that there were only three people who knew of this routine of Jared's. Jared didn't have any other enemies besides his ex-wife and her husband. Uh, really, no one knew that he would be there. And it's a pretty nonviolent area. But he's going down this isolated, lonely, dark road when he notices that there's a tire in the middle of the road blocking the road. Now, when I told my husband this, he, he immediately made me stop the story and he was like, oh no. And I said, wait, how do you already know what's going to happen? And he said, this has been since the dawn of time. If a bandit is going to raid a traveling merchant, they're going to put something in the middle of the path as a distraction. Everybody knows this. If you've ever played an RPG game, you know this. And I was like, Oh my God, I, I truly wouldn't have even thought of something like this. I would have also similarly gotten out of the car to move the tire, which is what he did. Everybody who has spoken of Jared describes him as this loving, just overly helpful, 
all American good guy. And so, of course, he's going to move the tire out of the road. Someone just said in the chat, yep, I've seen this tactic in Iraq. So apparently it's common bandit thug behavior. Now, Jared was not alone. And I don't just mean that because of the person who murdered him, obviously. Jared had with him his young two-year-old daughter in the seat. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are parents and you remember your children being two. Your kids are not babies anymore at two. Two, especially two and a half, because two to two and a half is practically a whole year change in itself. You, you don't get away with things anymore. You don't get to just swear in front of your kids anymore. You don't get to get away with watching R-rated movies in front of your kids anymore. They're awake to the world. They're cognizant. They understand things. They're getting out their consonants, if not their words, already. He straps his two, keeps his two-year-old strapped in her car seat. He goes out to take care of the tire and is gunned down right in front of his two-year-old's eyes. One of the bullets ripped through the car and almost hit her. She watched her dad go down. She told her mother when she got home that night, boom, boom, daddy on the ground. She remembers. She remembers that night. Jared's wife has also posted videos since then of her talking to their daughter, who is named Bexley. And... Bexley cries and begs her mom not to leave her, ever. She says, please don't go. The bad guys will get you. The bad people will get you. Please let me keep you safe here, mommy. For what? For why? Now, after this happened, it's... It's a relief that we know now who pulled the trigger. But no one in Jared's answer, in, in Jared's family, would receive answers for a full year. So imagine being in this situation. You've just found out that your husband's been murdered. The father of your children has been taken from you. Your son just died. You've lost your brother. And not just days pass by, not just weeks, not just months. It's really looking like for four full seasons, we're not even going to get one suspect. So what happens immediately after the murder by the way i want to get into literally the the hours the days immediately following before we start catching up with everything we know now now one of the things that seems to just get swept under the rug even today as people are starting to cover this story more and more is that jared may not have been the only target and that his wife may have narrowly avoided the same fate. I want to watch this with you now. This was released. Uh, this is a news video from just a few days after the murder. We are following developing news in the murder of a St. John's County father, Jared Bridegate. Let me start that over for you guys. Are trying to identify I apologize. There we go. We are following developing news in the murder of a St. John's County father, Jared Bridegate. So investigators are trying to identify a suspicious person caught on camera at Kirsten Breidigan's home days after her husband's death. News for Jackson reporter Brianna Andrews is joining us now. And Brianna, the Breidigan family is pretty shaken up. 
Kirsten Bradigan says she is scared and not okay. The person was caught on camera on February 24th, a week after Jared was shot to death. Kirsten gave this security footage to News 4 Jax. In the footage, a bright blurry figure can be seen moving quickly from the corner of the garage across the yard and away from the house. Again, the footage was captured on February 24th, days after Bridegan's murder. The 33-year-old father of four was shot multiple times near Sanctuary Boulevard near JTB, just two miles from his ex-wife's home. His two-year-old daughter was in the SUV when he was shot, but wasn't hurt. This is video from February 16th, the night of Jared Bridegan's murder. Police say it was a targeted attack. So far, no arrests have been made. Jacksonville Beach police are looking for a 2004 to 2008 blue Ford F-150, which they think may be connected to the murder. Police say a tire left in the road prompting Jared to stop is a key piece of the puzzle. Now, if you have any information at all, call First Coast Crime Stoppers. That number is 1-866-845-TIPS. You can, of course, remain anonymous. Now, there is an, a reward up to $30,000. Um, cause it, it's, it had since gone up. It's crazy. It, the reward started within the first couple days and I think like 5,000, then it jumped up to 15,000. Um, by this point, only eight days, I want to say they said afterward, eight days later, it was up to 30,000. It got all the way up to, I think fat past $50,000 for a reward. Um, the, the stakes were very high. So this is another thing too, that a lot of people aren't even covering anymore was could you imagine especially being a woman I mean when my husband goes out of town for a couple days I am like not too far from the dog at all times just being a woman without a man in the house is such a different feeling especially when you have young children especially when you're used to that security it, it's a security that's hard to imagine. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, you men would also benefit from the security of having another man in the house. You know, just the security of even, like, having neighbors near you. But just having someone there for you. And now to be this poor woman who's just lost her husband, the father, to her children, the love of her life, knowing in her heart that it was probably not a freak accident, knowing that it was a very likely people she knew. And then having to go through this traumatic fear of, is it gonna be me next? Is it gonna be my children next? Keep in mind, this is a woman who, she already knows that the people that she has to fear the most have their kids. They've all got the only kids they care about. They clearly don't care about her kids because they don't care about the bullets whizzing past them or if they're hit or not. She had no reason to believe that she was safe. And, and what recourse does she have? She doesn't even have the breadwinner in her family anymore. I, I don't know what she does for work. She may make a ton of money, right? But it probably not enough to hire 24-7 bodyguards. Who can? Besides Sherry and Sterling Gardner for their precious daughter. Terrifying. And this is another thing too I want to cover, um, not entirely related to this case, but just while we're discussing scary traps and ways that you can be lured such as a tire in the middle of the road or something like that you know clearly might just be best to swerve around it um another one that's been going around just so that everyone is aware while we're talking about these traps is people are getting women to pretend to scream that they need help um they're they're getting women to act as though they are damsels in distress so that when you come to help, they can rob you. It's sick. It's really sick how people, the worst types of people, use the best types of people 
to do the worst types of things. Isn't that crazy that the majority of these traps involve a person being a good person for them to even work? How sad is that? So moving forward from there, we're at about eight days after the death of Jared. And 12 days after, so just a couple days after Kirsten now has to fear for her life, has a very reasonable belief that someone is coming for her and targeting her. This one probably hasn't slept in days. She's trying to piece her life together in any semblance while trying to cooperate with investigators, while trying to comfort her children. And Shanna decides that the appropriate thing to do, the biggest priority here, is to start texting Kirsten, hey, don't forget that you still have some of the kids' library books they need to return. That's what you care about right now? You think that's what she cares about right now? Her husband was just murdered mysteriously after dropping off your children mysteriously in an area that only you knew he would be in and you're asking me to take care of these freaking library books then because shanna has no class whatsoever she then starts asking kirsten for Jared's death certificate. Excuse me? Your lawyer can obtain that for you. Yeah, the lawyer that you've paid tens of potentially hundreds of thousands to at this point to file needless after needless after needless complaint and charge or whatever they are against Jared through the family courts. You, you can't simply get your lawyer to get that for you. What kind of a move is that? Because that's what that is. That's, you don't, you don't need to get the death certificate from his grieving widow. That was a, both the library books and the death certificate was salt in her open wound. That was Shanna just being salt bay into the knife wound in the back of a grieving widow. That's the kind of people we're dealing with in this story today. So these are the days following. Now, of course, you may be wondering, you know, what's Jared's funeral like? Of course, Jared has his funeral. Shanna was not invited. And Shanna was very bitter that she was not invited to the funeral. And she made it known. And would you like to know what the gardeners and Mario Fernandez decided to do? Was they decided to have their own celebration of life for Jared. Uh, on the day of his funeral, since they weren't invited, they were going to have a better party with gourmet taco bars and alcohol. And they were going to just delightfully pose together with the kids. Oh, I almost left that detail out. That's right. The kids weren't allowed to go to their dad's funeral. Because... Shanna was not invited. She did not allow the children to go to their own father's funeral out of spite. And instead, had them take cute little photos with her and Mario Fernandez, smiling 
on the day of their dad's death, eating tacos. Now at this time, Kirsten's trying to keep in touch with her stepkids. Look, they've already lost their dad. They don't need to lose their stepmom and their siblings, do they? Shanna decided they did. At first, Shanna decided that she would allow the children one weekly FaceTime call with their siblings and their siblings only. That's right. Kirsten was not allowed to talk at all to her stepkids. She was not allowed to say a word or else the phone call would be hung up. Only the two-year-old can talk, apparently. And as time passed, these calls stopped being responded to. Kirsten would call and it would go unanswered. And eventually, you know, what turned into excuses of, oh, we're busy, oh, we just can't today, just became ghosting, no reply, until eventually the whole number was blocked. So now, these kids have just lost their father, and their whole family has just been ripped out from under their noses. Yeah, I'm sure these kids don't have any questions at all. So, let's get caught up on the case after a full year investigation. When we finally get a break. The last year has been filled with grief and questions from Jared Bridegan's family and his now widow, Kirsten Bridegan. It was here on this stretch of roadway outside of the sanctuary neighborhood. The father of four was ambushed and murdered. But with the recent announcement of an arrest in this case, answers are starting to come in. And Kirsten says she hopes this is just the beginning. It was the moment the Bridegan family had been waiting for. Just under an hour ago, this man, Henry Tennant, was arrested. A face, a name, an arrest in the murder of Jared Bridegan. But authorities say there's more to it. We know Henry Tennant did not act alone. Describing Henry Tennant as a piece of a conspiracy to kill the father of four that night, February 16th, 2022. Jared had just dropped off his twins, Abby and Liam, to his ex-wife's home in Jacksonville Beach. In the car with him still was his two-year-old daughter, Bexley. Police say as he was turning out of the sanctuary neighborhood onto a narrow, dimly lit section of road, a tire had been placed in the street. He opened his door and to presumably move the tire out of the road. It was then that he was gunned down in cold blood. Shot multiple times in front of little Bexley, strapped into her car seat. From the beginning, Jacksonville Beach Police said Bridegan was targeted. It was not by chance. It was an ambush. The first clue to be publicly released, pictures of a blue truck seen in the area around the time of Jared's murder. But much of the rest of the investigation has been kept under wraps. As national interest in Jared's murder grew, there was much speculation about his acrimonious divorce from his first wife, Shanna Gardner Fernandez. One story claims she asked a Jacksonville tattoo artist about someone who could, quote, shut him up. In an interview with the Florida Times Union, she called the implication she was involved in Jared's murder sensationalistic and inaccurate. As they waited for answers, Bridegan's family and widow Kirsten Bridegan continued the push for tips and to make sure his story was not forgotten. They say the grief and the pain of the last year has felt like a roller coaster of emotions. Every day it's, it's just up and down, it's, it's gut wrenching. And as most victims can attest to, it feels like a life sentence of a burden. In late January, the first step to getting answers finally came. The arrest of Henry Tennant for murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and child abuse. He has pled not guilty to all charges. 
But digging deeper, a connection was uncovered in this case. Tenant had rented a property from Mario Fernandez, the husband of Shanna Gardner Fernandez, Bridegan's ex-wife and the mother of his twins he'd been dropping off that night. I was not surprised that there was connection. Um, it's tragic. You know, like my immediate thought is for Liam and Abigail and what they're going through right now because what that could implicate. But I was not surprised with that connection being made. The Fernandezes have not been linked to Breidigan's death or charged with any crime. Kirsten Breidigan says she will never stop pushing for answers because above all else, Jared's children deserve to know the truth. He was a dedicated father. He did everything for his children. And for them to be suddenly without that dad, without that father figure, who can't be replaced, like they will never have their dad back. I want answers. The arrest warrant and affidavit for Henry Tenen will be sealed until February 24th, but that's when we expect to learn more about the evidence against him and the conspiracy around Jared's murder. But Jacksonville Beach Police say if you have any information about Tenen or Jared Bridegan's murder, to please reach out to them. So that's where we had left off as of about February was the man who actually pulled the trigger and killed Jared has been caught, has been arrested, and has been conclusively linked back to Mario Fernandez, the husband of Jared's ex-wife, Shanna Gardner. There's a few too many kowinky dinks here, I think, for any of us to play dumb. Okay, what, what motivation does anybody have for just setting a trap to murder someone random and then, oh, that happens to be the ex-husband of the wife of the guy I'm renting from who also happens to be married into millions and millions of dollars hmm sure wonder how that could have gone down but look here's the thing there's the death penalty in florida and look money talks but the death penalty sometimes talks louder so if you don't think that our good friend Henry Tennant, sorry, 30th. if you don't think our good friend Henry Tennant did a little bit of singing, uh, well, you'd, you'd think wrong because we, we got some, some singing in that jail cell and we have another, another little announcement here. Let me see. Which one I want to get to here. Do, do, do. So let's get caught up here with the latest news as of a week ago, I want to say. Mario Fernandez, the second person arrested in the murder of Jared Bridegan in Jacksonville Beach last year. He had his yeah. first appearance in court today. We got him. In the Orlando area yesterday. And any day now, Fernandez will be brought back to Jacksonville. He's married to Bridegan's ex-wife. While he's the second person arrested in the deadly shooting of the father of four, investigators suggest at least one other person is also involved. News for Jack's reporter Ann Maxwell breaks down what's next for him and what we know about this suspect's past. Janice, it's not clear yet when Fernandez will be brought here to the Duval County Jail. I spoke with one of his neighbors today who said Fernandez and his wife, who again is Jared Bridegan's ex-wife, are always nice and friendly. He also said their luxurious lifestyle raised eyebrows.
Investigators believe 34-year-old Mario Fernandez hired a hitman to ambush Jared Brightigan in an attack on Sanctuary Boulevard in Jacksonville Beach 13 months ago. According to an affidavit, Fernandez paid three handwritten checks to Henry Tenen, who rented a house from Fernandez but didn't have any direct ties to the victim. The state attorney says Tenen admitted to shooting Brightigan, pleading guilty to second-degree murder. Criminal defense attorney Curtis Fallgetter, who is not affiliated with this case, says it's now unlikely Tenen will be facing the death penalty, but Fernandez might. It is a very heinous crime and a contract murder deserves uh, the death penalty in appropriate circumstances. But second of all, if the wife was involved, they would want to bring her to justice. So that would put pressure on him, rightfully so. Fernandez's wife, Shana Gardner Fernandez, has previously denied being involved in the murder. According to an affidavit for Fernandez's arrest, the couple met in 2018 at a CrossFit gym where he worked in maintenance. Sources tell News for Jax Gardner Fernandez moved to Washington State with the two children she shared with Bride again. The Daily Mail reported in January Fernandez was staying with his brother in Orlando. Orlando. While Fernandez is being represented by a public defender, his wife hired a high-profile local criminal defense attorney months ago. I would suspect that might have uh, caused some hard feelings and would uh, be a factor that if I'm him, might feel like I don't need to have, be loyal to her anymore. Neighbors told News for Jax the couple hasn't lived in their Jacksonville Beach home for a few months. Duval County court records don't show any prior arrests for Fernandez. Just a few just a few traffic tickets. For now, reporting live downtown and Maxwell Channel 4, the local station. Thanks, guys. Oh, I, I missed the chat. Okay, I'm no longer muted. Uh, okay, so basically where we're at is Tenen sung like a bird, ratted Mario's ass out, he's in jail. This isn't looking good for Shanna and the Gardner family. It, not at all. It's not looking good for stamping up the millions of millions of dollars worth company so you know they had to come out with a press release as soon as mario is arrested and it is one of the ugliest press releases you could imagine they downplayed things so much they it, it was something along the lines of ah uh, you may have heard our daughter shanna is associated with a man involved in some crimes involved in something but don't worry, everyone. Our daughter, Shanna, has been separated from that man for a very long time. Don't you worry. We have no involvement. Really? Really, they've just been separated for so long. Were they separated when they were going on multiple vacations with you guys and your family? Just days, weeks, and months after the murder? Were they separated then? Because I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, that we have multiple photos from your family blogs. Or did you forget that you very publicly have maintained a blog of your family events with photos of you vacationing with Mario and Shanna gardeners? Come on, let's be for real here. So here's the situation that we're in now, is Mario's behind bars. Shanna has since taken the kids and moved out of state to Washington without, and she moved before Mario was arrested and she moved without him. I'm imagining the, the walls were closing in and she recognized that it was time to bail from him. And now they're trying to distance themselves as much as possible, but again... Florida's got the death penalty 
And I think it's very likely that he would be offered by prosecutors, hey, we'll take the death penalty off if you sell out your wife. I really had to hold back calling her something a lot more mean. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like that last reporter said, what reason is he going to really have to maintain loyalty to her if it means that he could be facing the death penalty? Because all of this was worth it when he was going on these luxurious vacations and living this high lifestyle and he had access to all these millions. I think money can really change a person. Who knows what kind of a woman Shanna would be or a man Mario would be if they didn't have access to that kind of money. Or maybe the, maybe the question is more of reverse, you know. Maybe the only way they would have ever been good people is if they didn't have access to that kind of money. It's hard to say. But what we do know is that Mario didn't really have hitman kind of money until he met Shanna. And, oh, I see. So your someone is still commenting on mute, but I fixed it now. And, oh God, where was I now? Sorry, I got it. Don't read the chat while you're in the middle of rambling. But he no longer has access to the gardener's money. I guess that's not true. I, I don't really know how the whole jail commissary works. But I can't imagine, even if they are sending him that good, good commissary money, that it's going to be enough ramen, pa ramen packets to completely shut him up if he's going to get a better deal where he might see the light of day again. This is where we, we have to question how much loyalty can be purchased. We really don't know at this point. But he's behind bars. Now, I also wanted to show you guys some other videos for further context because I wanted to catch you up so that you all know who we know did it, who we know is involved. As far as the investigation goes, there's no other details to reveal. There's no other like grand reveal here. So far, what we know is Henry's arrested and has pled guilty. Mario has been arrested. We're going to watch um, his indictment being read. In fact, let's just get into that right now. He knows he ain't going to see a diamond commissary at this point. So what are we going to do? Sonny Drexler Hill appearing on the There's a moment I want to watch with you guys. Sonny Drexler this. along with my law partner. James Hill, uh, Your Honor, this is a indictment. So, at, to, for today's purposes, we're going to reserve on any bond arguments or any probable cause. Watch his face when they read the child abuse charge. Okay, now we know why he's being charged with child abuse. None of us are questioning it. But he seems to have an issue with being charged with child abuse. But you know who doesn't? Cause arguments. And if it's my understanding, April 13th. Is, is the guy behind him. Day. Just watch. All right. Because it's a warrant, um, I am told I need to pass it to April the 4th. Is that right, Madam Clerk? Sure. Okay. So, um, so we're referring to him as Mr. Fernandez, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Fernandez, good morning. Um, this, is, this is an indictment. The charges are solicitation to commit a capital felony, conspiracy to commit murder, murder in the first degree, and child abuse. Um, so a probable cause has already been found. <laughs> Can I zoom in on this real quick? Can we just watch that again in real time? Okay. Mr. Fernandez, good morning. Um, this, is, this is an indictment. The charges are solicitation to commit a capital felony, conspiracy to commit murder, murder in the first degree, and child abuse. Um, so a probable cause. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing so hard at that, but like 
the way they were like child abuse and he's like and the guy behind him was like like you might have been surprised by that we're not surprised by that buckaroo okay he, bro you almost had a two-year-old killed and you definitely had a full-grown man killed quite frankly intentionally going out of your way to take away someone's father who they love is an active fit involved member of their life that that in and of itself even if the kids weren't involved in the murder that itself is child abuse quite frankly i understand that a court of public or the court of law isn't necessarily going to be with me on that but in this situation they certainly are He's going to have fun on the block with that one. Yeah, once we, once we get the child abuse charge thrown in, that is when you really do not want to be dropping no soap in that jail. Let's hear from Shanna. I know you guys really are just dying to hear her side of things. So now that you know everything, I, I thought about playing this prior to the big reveal of who did it, but it's better after three-year-old father Jared Brightigan was gunned down in front of his two-year-old daughter. It's a murder that stunned Jack's Beach neighbors, which have rallied behind his widow and four children. Now, some tabloids have cast suspicion on his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner. Those tabloids followed and photographed her and questioned her innocence. And Gardner has not spoken publicly to anyone about Breidigan's murder until now. And tonight, in the only TV interview she says that she will be doing, Action News Jack's Kristen Rary has the exclusive interview with Gardner. As her innocence has come into question, Shanna Gardner spoke to me in the only TV interview she says she'll be doing to tell her side of the story. I do want people to understand, you know, where I'm coming from. Almost five months after Jared Brightigan was murdered in the street in front of his two-year-old daughter, we spoke with his ex-wife, who has not commented publicly so far. Our first question, why have you stayed silent? I was asked to not talk to the media or give a public statement, but with the level of speculation, I felt that now it was necessary to, to speak out. Shanna Gardner revealed she was asked by Jared Brightigan's widow, Kirsten, not to speak publicly, but we wanted to know how the relationship could have gotten to that point. I'm sure they, you would say that we've had happy moments. I mean, we share the two most beautiful children in the world. In 2015, Jared and Shanna divorced. Their court records, which we obtained from the St. Johns County court system, revealed a long, complicated process lasting over five years. Anytime divorce comes into any situation, it's messy. It just is. I will say that I think that we both love our kids. Jared and Shanna both wanted full custody. The court file details allegations of spying, deceit, and more. In the end, Shanna and Jared reached an agreement. They shared custody, and whenever the children were at one parent's house, the other would come over Wednesday and have a date night. That's exactly what Jared and his twins did the night he was killed. It was actually one of the, one of the things, I'm sorry. Um, I remember my son tucking him in and him saying that it was a good date night. But that happiness would end just minutes after leaving Shanna's house just over two miles from her home. In a quiet neighborhood with few security cameras, a tire was rolled out into the street. Jared got out of his car to move it and was shot dead. His two-year-old daughter sat in the car, strapped into her car seat alone for three minutes before someone came to help. I was shocked. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Jared died in that street, leaving behind four children and a heartbroken family. They were, I think, in shock. Later, in a blog post, Shanna's mother said she was not invited to the funeral. I asked Shanna about the situation. His family did not invite me or want me there. But the day before a vigil hosted by Jared's widow at Celebration Park, Shanna was photographed at the park with her kids by the tabloid Daily Mail. Talk about a violation of privacy, because my kids know that they were photographed and they were worried. The tabloid presented the facts in a way that leave room for speculation about Shanna having a role in Jared's death, citing their rocky divorce papers and her absence from the funeral. Even though we didn't always get along, he was still the father of my kids. 
So I asked Shanna the question. Did you have anything to do with Jared's murder? No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. Shanna says she has no idea if the murder was targeted or what Jared was involved in, saying they ran in different circles. But Action News Jax reported in June, Shanna had hired criminal defense attorney Hank Cox. He was referred to me by several friends and ultimately my kids' images and videos Bitch, were being what? used in the media without consent. Shanna said Cox was hired to protect her kids. I asked her if she thinks she will face criminal charges. She says no, that she's cooperated with detectives. Do you have any idea who might have done this? I do not have any idea. I, as I said, we've been divorced. We don't run in the same social circles. I, all I know is that I would never want anybody to go through this. She told me if she could speak to Jared again, she'd say one thing. Honestly, that I wish it weren't like this. I wish things could, could have been and could be different. And Shanna told me despite this happening in her neighborhood, despite many people around her discussing the case, she has no intention of leaving Jack's Beach or Jacksonville. Meanwhile, police continue their search for the killer and they ask the community for any help it can provide. For local coverage, you can count on in the studio, Kristen Ray. Well, that didn't age well. I'm going to stay in the area, flees to Washington State immediately. I mean, none of this has aged very well. She tried it, though. She really tried it. She was like, you know what? I think I could pull it off. I think I could make people believe me. I think if they just see what I look like and they see me, like, start to cry when thinking about his death, I think that they'll immediately be like, yeah, no, she's not involved at all. I'm like really horrified because I am thinking about what these kids must be thinking. Those are not young, easy, impressionable kids. They, they know what's up. You can't keep hiding this from them. Now there's one more that I wanted to show you too, which is a lot of you might be asking, you know, hold on, reopen, close tab. This is the widow of You might be asking, were there any red flags? Were there any signs? that Jared or his wife can think of leading up to this. The widow of Jared Bridegan is now opening up to the News 4 Jack's Eye team for the first time since an arrest was announced in her husband's murder. I have felt since the beginning that this was planned, this was thought out, and this was specific to Jared. And Bridegan's brother, Adam, reveals Jared had a haunting fear before he was gunned down. I won't get into specifics, but I, I did have several conversations with Jared where he did express concerns that something like this could happen to him. The man now held in Bridegan's murder made his first appearance in court today on a list of charges. That arrest is giving the family of Jared Bridegan hope, but they say this is not over yet. Investigators say Henry Tennant did not act alone and that the murder was a targeted ambush. They believe someone placed this tire in the road and when Bridegan got out of his SUV to move it, he was shot to death. Tarek, we'll have more in a moment on Tenen's court appearance. We begin, though, with news for Jack's I team investigator, Vic Michalucci, who sat down with Bridegan's widow and brother about this new development in the case. A beloved father of four, Jared Bridegan meant the world to his family, loved ones who have not given up hope, even after nearly a year without answers. There are times here and there that I was concerned. Um, I'd reach out to law enforcement and just say, is there anything you can tell me? And, you know, they reassured me, hey, we're working diligently. Like, we are not forgetting Jared. Bridegan's widow, Kirsten, and his older brother, Adam, telling us today for the first time. Thank you for being here today. They have some sort of an answer after learning someone's been arrested for murder in connection with the case. 61-year-old Henry Tenen behind bars. A step in the right direction. Huge step. 
Had either of you ever heard of Henry Tenen before he came up in the investigation? Never in our lives. I have no, I, no idea who this individual is. But the News for Jack's I team uncovered property records linking Tenen to Mario Fernandez. He's married to Bridegan's ex-wife, Shayna Gardner Fernandez. At the time of the shooting, Tenen rented a room in the home that Fernandez owned. What do you think about that connection between Henry Tenen and Jared's ex-wife's husband. I mean, it's scary, right? It's, it's frightening, frankly, that there is a connection and that there is this mass conspiracy. It, it does not help us sleep at night. Shanna and Mario Fernandez have not been charged, nor have they been publicly named as suspects. Shanna has said she had... That's about it. Uh, as far as them talking about any kind of like warning signs, um, they don't get into very much specifics. And I do wonder how much of that is for legal purposes. Um, one thing to note as well is that Mario Fernandez intends to plead not guilty. I'm not sure how you're going to explain why you were writing three large checks to someone who's supposed to be writing checks to you. Maybe he's going to try to turn this around into some like, oh, he'd overpaid a couple of months or some bullshit. It, it's going to be pretty hard to explain, especially because cybersecurity professionals really can get to the bottom of so many things. And I refuse to believe that this Mario guy is some hyper-intelligent dude able to get away with this stuff. Truly, what it comes down to is Sh Shanna comes from a family of money. And look, her parents are not innocent. I, I know that. I just know it. Okay. Neither of those two, Shanna and Mario, they do not have any skill sets to which either of them could ever truly acquire money otherwise. Neither of them have any other skills besides being terrible people. They're not even good criminals. Clearly. The only thing protecting Shanna right now is her parents' money. That's the only thing. And that is why I'm being so outspoken against this company, Stampin' Up! And against Sherry and Sterling Gardner. Because as long as they continue to protect their daughter, knowing what their daughter has done. And again, I should once again specify, knowing what she has probably done, this is all speculation. We have no evidence that Shanna is definitively involved. But I am saying that none of us are this stupid. And I don't know. It's... We all have to ask ourselves what we would do if this was our child in the situation, right? We have no idea if we would attempt to protect them or if we would believe their insane and very unlikely version of events. I'm really trying to be empathetic here. I'm, I'm trying to put myself in old Sherry's dusty boots and I'm trying to say, like, okay, what if my daughter was in the situation and she's the one telling me, I promise you, mom, I didn't do anything to my ex-husband. My husband can be a little crazy. I think he might have done something, but I promise you, like, I did not tell him to. He acted on his own. Like, I, I'm not going down for this because I didn't do anything wrong. Like, I could see a parent falling for that. I really could. I could see people believing her. And our sincerest hope is that we don't have to, that we end up getting text messages or that 
Mario flips on her. Truly. Because that's that's our that's our only hope right now. Now if you want to get another terrific look. I want to go to his wife's Instagram. And we can look at some of her posts because she is out here doing the work for her husband, that's for sure. All right, let's move this over. So go ahead and follow this page. This is Kirsten herself. Um, and she has been doing an incredible job covering everything. One of the things that I want to highlight that Kirsten has started doing since all this went down is obviously Bexley was left alone for quite a period of time um, before anybody could come help her and help Jared to the best they were able to. And when Bexley was brought to the police station, she was also kind of alone there for a long time. And there weren't really any snacks. There was nothing to play with. And so what Kirsten has done is she started something called Bexley boxes, which what I have to log in. To, give me just a second, guys. Sorry. <laughs> this should only take a second. If I remember my passwords anyway. It's one of these. There we go. I gotta prove that I'm really me. Sorry, guys. Okay, we're back. I can show you the Bexley boxes now. Oh my God. Okay. We're back in, as you can see, dark mode activated. Now let's look at the, why is this taking so long? Audio? Yeah. They did have a coloring book and some coloring supplies that she was using. All right. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong storyline. Yeah, she's got, I will say, though, she's got all of the updates and everything um, really consolidated into these story formats, which is nice. Let me refresh this and see if it wants to be nice to me now. Come on, Instagram, load us up some Jared justice. Come on now. No idea why it's being this way. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to see. Man, this is kind of hard to, like, look at while you're on desktop. I'm trying to see. Okay, so it's mostly just her talking about the Bex boxes I was trying to see if it actually showed them like in action but it kind of discusses you can read more about it here I want to respond to one of the comments about Shanna that says she was poisoning the water long before it hit or long before the hit and it's funny that you say that about her poisoning the well because another thing that I was reading as I was getting like every detail I could about this case is that investigators did talk to one of the secretaries or the staffers at the children's private school. And she described that Shanna had been speaking terribly about Jared uh, almost immediately. She said that on their very first time ever meeting that she had immediately began disparaging Jared, bringing up the divorce and essentially trying to make him look bad right off the jump. And this is one of those things that I think is one of the scariest parts about this case is that the details leading up to the inciting incident are 
all too familiar details for too many fathers. I think that there are so many parents who are familiar with this. I know that this was something that my husband had to face was he is sharing a son with someone that son is in private school and very similarly wells were attempted to be poisoned we were told by multiple staff at the school we were told by multiple parents of our child's classmates that mom definitely tried to make him look bad definitely got ahead of the game i don't know if these women don't realize that some people will just straight up tell on you uh, we've definitely just had mothers and fathers of our son's friends tell us, oh yeah, she's tried to make you look bad to us. Oh, she's definitely tried. And they don't think that they're going to tell us. They think that it'll just remain like this secret or something, or that people don't judge the shit out of you for trying to poison a well ahead of time. Like, they don't think that we recognize that game. But really, when you're meeting someone, most of us, if we meet someone, especially for the first time, and the first thing they're trying to do is poison the well against someone else, try to get us to have a negative opinion about someone else before you may have even met them, that's, I think, all of our bullshit meters start to go off a little bit when stuff like that happens. It's... I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe some of you guys, I, and I know some of you have probably had that happen successfully where there weren't enough skeptics and they did successfully get their narrative in ahead of the curve and were able to make you look like absolute dog shit. And I think that Shanna unfortunately had a very uphill battle, much the same as whomever has tried to say negative things about my husband is it just it doesn't go over very well is you can try and poison the well and get in ahead of the curve and say oh he's just he's lazy he's absent he's a deadbeat he's not involved he doesn't he doesn't care he's a really bad person well that's really hard to maintain when my husband is actually showing up to everything actually constantly trying to be involved, actually volunteering all the time, it kind of cuts some holes in this whole story you're trying to paint to people of him just trying to be like some abusive narcissist or whatever it is that are the hot button buzzwords that we all want to use about people we don't like. There's, there's a quote and it goes something along the lines of always maintain your character in such a way to that if somebody were to try to speak ill of you, no one would even believe them. And that was something Jared did every day was he wasn't the kind of person who did kind things so that he would look better. He wasn't the kind of person who only showed up to very publicized status quo events so that he would look like an involved father. He was a man who genuinely loved kids, loved his kids, and was gonna be there every day as an involved father. He was gonna be there for those kids graduating college, getting their first jobs. He wanted to meet his grandchildren. Everything that I've found, even pouring through as much of the custody paperwork as you can find available online, it's, it's a losing mission trying to actually catch Jared being a bad person. Whereas you talk to Shanna's friends, you talk to Shanna's indirect family, people who knew her, it doesn't look good. It does not look good. She seemed to be, by all accounts, a selfish, spoiled, entitled witch of a woman who couldn't handle sharing, who could not handle 
seeing her ex-husband living a happy, successful life that she couldn't control. That she wasn't able to destroy enough. How dare he get to share custody of her kids? Who does he think he is even when she is Shanna Gardner, heir to the Stampin' Up! legacy? Who do you think you are trying to have any control in your own life? I just, I understand that Mr. Tennant is the one who pulled the trigger multiple times and that he is the one who almost killed a two-year-old child. I understand that insofar as we know, Mario Fernandez is the only one who had been in communication with Mr. Tennant regarding this situation or not, or not. Maybe they were just chatting. So far... We do not have clear, cut and dry public evidence that Shanna was directly involved. Maybe, just maybe, her husband decided to take care of all of this for her. I mean, sure, she might have been trying to solicit for hitmans in various tattoo shops. Maybe, but I mean, who doesn't as a little jokey joke now and again? I said, dripping with sarcasm, if you can't tell. If you're looking at the situation and you're not pointing all arrows back to Shanna, I don't know how to help you. I really don't. You don't live in the real world if that's the situation. And it's just so heartbreaking and messed up that once again, just like with the Chad Reed shooting, when we have Kyle Carruth reported by patrons out at the bar that he was seen at within the week bragging about how much blood there was to power wash off his deck, and forcing these kids to go on vacation with their dad's murderer, history repeats itself. We're seeing the exact same thing. On a day where these children should have been with their father for the last time that he would ever be above ground, they were instead posing with their father's Murderer. At least one of them. I want to say murderers. I don't know if I legally can, but that's what I want to say. Okay? Because in my personal opinion, there's no way Shanna's not involved. And there's no way that her kids aren't going to see that. And as long as we have situations that we've been able to learn from, such as Chad Reed, such as Dear Zachary, where a woman murdered her child's father in cold blood and she pulled the trigger herself, then fled, then you guys still gave her the child back. And what did she do? That woman took her baby, strapped the baby to her chest, and then jumped in the icy cold ocean for them both to drown. And we've learned nothing from that. We're still handing children back to their father's murderers, not realizing that that could very well result in the same fate. I'm not being dramatic. That's not a crazy thing to insinuate. It's not. Women like this, who don't have a single care for the consequences of having the father of their children murdered, 
are the same types who would have their own children killed if it meant their children were close to learning the truth. We know this. Those children are not safe with Shanna. They're not safe with Sherry and Sterling Gardner. They're not safe with anyone in that dirty, dank, nasty, decrepit family. Not a one of them. They're not safe with the CEO sister who so far has nothing allegedly to do with this. Those kids shouldn't be anywhere near that family. And I don't want to hear, oh, they just lost their father. They can't lose their mom too. That Yes, they can. If it's between them losing their abusive, terrible mother or them losing their own lives, I pick them losing their mother. I think that we can all agree if we're really thinking about what's in the best interest of those children, there's no way Shanna Gardner is the best interest on any planet, in any realm, in any timeline. And I see you guys in the comments saying Shanna is probably not going to be held accountable. And I have a lot, I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of optimism and that's why we're not letting this go. And that's why we're talking about this is because the more people know about this, the more creators covering this story and putting the pressure on the closer to justice we will be. Okay. Here's what really needs to happen. If we can just take it a little bit more lighthearted for a second, I'm not being for real for real, but I'm being a little bit for real when I say this. One of y'all needs to take one for the team and go bang Shanna's brains out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Okay. If Mario sees Shanna moving on with some other dude, which I'm sure she already has, I'm sure she's already joined some other like fitness boxing gym and is getting it in with somebody's husband as we speak. One of y'all needs to just show that shit to Mario so that a brother can move on with his life and rat her ass out already. Okay? This short king's got to learn the hard truth in life. His wife's a hoe and the sooner he comes to terms with it and gets to singing the sooner we can all have justice for Jared Bride again. Okay? God damn it, I wish you weren't right about that. <laughs> Someone in the chat says, knowing the USA legal system, you're more likely to be sued for defamation than the rich person being prosecuted. Look, get the fuck out of here with your truth, okay? I don't want to hear that right now. <laughs> I don't need to look in the face of that reality. I already don't like the reality I'm looking down the barrel of now. How do you risk your own freedom for someone? Or over someone? Sure, they might be dead, but now you're facing, at the minimum, life in prison. This is the thing, is I can see this happening because... I, I hate to, like, compare it to a fictional series, but if the latest series of you has shined a light on anything, it's that it's true. The people who are more likely to take things to a really dark path, to go down, like, the full-on murder route, because they're not seeing things through the same lens of reality as the rest of us, are rich people. And rightfully so. The, the same rules clearly do not apply to them. Who's more likely to get away with this shit? Rich people. And this is a guy who I'm imagining probably lives his life going on like seven holidays a year. He probably doesn't know what it's like to have to actually rent a jet ski because he's probably able to just borrow some from his new in-laws anytime he wants. L life is good when you're rich. There's not much you have to worry about. Right? Speeding ticket, don't worry about it. They're, they're, that's probably why they were so shocked that they couldn't simply buy custody. 
Especially in Florida, where get dads get screwed over left and right. I'm sure this is what led to this rage, was the shock that there was actually stuff that they couldn't buy. So to this family, yeah, if we can't buy custody through the legal system, we're going to buy it through the black market. We're going to buy it through the degenerates that we've chosen to rent property out to, apparently. I'm, ex I'm anticipating that, actually, Daniel. Daniel says in the comments, makes it even less likely because she'll cry in court about being a mother and will likely accuse Jared of abuse. She'll walk or get low consequences. She's definitely not going to get... God, I scratched my neck one time and it looks insane. Anyway, none of you guys care about that and I'm drawing attention to things that literally no one else would notice if I didn't say something. But I, I'm a little bit surprised that Shanna has not already come out with abuse claims. If we really get into the court files, which I'm still having a hard time getting access to, if anybody in chat is like really good at finding court files or knows how, like I'm even willing to pay for them if I have to. I would love to pull them up. But we do know that she's made such claims against Jared as like stalking um, was one of the big things, which sometimes people will bring stuff like that up in family courts over things like uh, trackers on phones or trackers on watches that are exchanged between the kids' homes. I've even covered this in videos in the past when it comes to like trackers being put on things is it's a very legal gray area and one that's not, I don't think has ever really been prosecuted because it is illegal for you to put trackers on other adults, right? But it is not illegal to track your own children. So because of that is I'm sure why Jared never actually faced any ramifications for any trackers he may or may not have been putting on the kids. That's an area where if you're asking for like my personal opinion on the situation, I think that I don't really think there's anything wrong with parents putting trackers on the kids inherently. I do think that your moral obligation, what you should be doing as a good co-parent, if you actually care about your kids being happy by having a good co-parenting relationship, you would tell the other parent that you're putting trackers on them. And I understand that's not always, you can't always do that because it wouldn't surprise me if in a situation like this, Jared says, hey, Shanna, if you don't mind, I'm going to put tracking software on the kid's phone so I know where they are. And she goes, okay, well, then they can't have phones. That happens all the time, too. We don't really know the situation in that. But what we do know is that she has not been able to showcase any abuse. If, if it was ever attempted to be brought up, she's been deeply unsuccessful with the claim. And so I've got to imagine at one point she must have given up my husband has faced similar things. He's never been fully accused of abuse, but he's been accused of shit. And when all of those accusations, similar to Jared's case, keep demonstrably coming out as false, eventually it, it takes the wind out of these people. They eventually kind of start to figure out a little bit, oh, okay, I can't get away with this, got to move on to this. I can't get away with this, got to move on to another narcissistic tool. There's always another narcissistic tool in the narcissist's tool belt. They've always got something else in their quiver of arrows to shoot at you, okay? So I'm not saying that it's gone forever. She very likely will still come back with some kind of abuse claim if she gets wrapped into it. For all we know, the abuse claim will come against Mario. Maybe it'll be, well, he put me in this situation and he made me feel that if I had to have an ex involved that we were both in danger, who knows? Maybe I'm giving her ideas at this point. <laughs> Maybe I'm helping Shanna's defense team with my speculation here. But the heat is on at this point, okay? There's a lot of people paying attention to this. Even people who don't necessarily care about 
equal shared parenting or father's rights. Even people who are the types to say like, oh yeah, mothers should get primary custody because they're the moms. Even those types are looking at the situation and saying, this is messed up. Jared should have never been killed. Shanna is suspect. I think we're all on the same page here. I don't think there is any, hold on, Riser says, I don't think there is any chance of Mario saying anything until it seems that he is absolutely getting a guilty verdict. In ratting out anybody, he would then have to admit to the crime. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Because like I said, as of right now, Mario Fernandez is intending on pleading not guilty. Which, I guess you gotta try. I guess you sure gotta try. And you're absolutely right about that. He is kind of in this, like, really shitty boat with Shanna, where if he throws her under the bus, then he's only implicating himself further. Whereas if he just continues to deny, 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 he might have a fighting chance. When is the next trial? Hold on. I have to look up when the next court date is. When is next trial? court date. Jared Bridegan murder trial. Let's see. Come on, court TV. Give us the answers. Tenen was arrested in January. Fernandez just got arrested. I think they said April 4th was the next day. But hold on. What is Daniel saying? Sorry, Lauren, you're missing a big part of the mark. She'll get lower, no consequences, far more because she's a woman than because money. That's true. What is the average? Uh, I think it's like women get on average like half the fees for the same crime or half the legal penalties. And then like, I think it was even as low as like a quarter of the j jail time for the same exact crime. It's, it's embarrassing. Like even if they directly connect her, yeah, I think it'll be a fraction of whatever sentence Mario sees. And like, what's so sad about like these rich bitches too, is that there's really no way to like, how do I want to say this? Like take her down a peg because she's just always, she's nothing more than a little bankroll baby for her parents. Like she has no skills. She has no aspirations. There's nothing great or even good that Shanna has ever done or contributed to society. She's never even like helped the family business. She's done nothing except live this very self-serving life where she obsesses over her own fitness, her own physical appearance, herself getting laid by beefy dudes at the gym as often as possible, herself being seen as the only parent who matters. There's, and because of this, there's nothing we can take away from her because she has nothing except for her obsession with herself. And her parents are just more than happy to enable that, as is her husband. And so we can't touch her. She's just going to keep doing whatever she wants to do. She'll probably go make friends with Casey Anthony in Florida, actually. And they can just talk about how hard life is when you're accused of things you didn't even do. I can just, honestly, that's what I can really see this turning into. If we're being completely honest with, like, the absolute hell world that 2023 has already become, 
the most likely scenario is not Jared getting justice. Honestly, like, the the old black dude who had nothing involved is probably going to see the most jail time. Mario will walk somehow or get an extremely light sentence and be able to get out of it with with barely any consequences. Shanna will walk, and in fact, she'll get welcomed onto a reality show with Casey Anthony and all the other women who got away with crimes, right? Maybe like Eileen Warno, so if she's still alive, they'll get her on the show. Uh, and it can just be like the, the real murderous housewives of Manhating County or something like that. That, all of that is more likely at this point than any representatives for our country looking at this situation and going, yeah, Warnos is dead. That was my bad. They'll, they'll reprise her as a lich queen for this, and that will still be more likely than anyone actually taking a look at these freaking cases and saying, Maybe it's time we changed the laws a little bit. I mean, truly, I really do believe that one of the biggest things that is going to prevent fathers from being murdered like this is equal shared parenting. One, just presumed equal shared parenting. Let's, let's stop with the fact that in 80% of counties, they are sole custody counties. Meaning, if two parents are in conflict over who should have primary legal and physical custody, and it does go to court, it is going to court on sole custody basis. Like, a lot of people who don't understand the legal system, they think that, oh, mom and dad, they break up. But what must happen is they look at it, they see what's going to be the most fair, and they cut it in the middle as fair as possible. But that's not what happens. Most counties are a sole custody county. Again, meaning that if two parents are in conflict over who should have that custody, you're not going to court to determine how the custody is split equally. You're going to court to determine now who gets all of the custody. Like, people really think that when you go to court that most often the judges are looking to award 50-50. Uh-uh-uh. No. Most often, 50-50 only exists because the parents agreed to it. That is probably 80 to 90% of how 50-50 happens is through either both parents agreeing to it or both parents being led to agree to it by their lawyers because that might actually be the best scenario scenario for them or cause the least conflict. But if it goes to court for custody, it's going to court for sole custody. That doesn't mean the other parent loses all of their rights per se, but it does mean that they entirely lose their rights when it comes to where the child lives. So if mom decides, hey, you just moved so that you could be 45 minutes away from me or you just moved so you could be even closer, maybe a mile away from me. Well, I don't like you being that close, so I'm going to completely move states. Well, they've got sole custody, so they're the ones who ultimately get to make that decision. You lose your decision on medical, right? It, if you do or do not want to give your child the COVID shot, doesn't matter. It's up to the custodial parent. If you do or do not want your child to go on a specific treatment plan to take medication for their ADHD or not, doesn't matter. That is not up to you. It is up to only the sole custodian parent. It's about decisions like school. Is your, said go is your kid going to go to parochial school or public school? You're, you really aren't a parent anymore if you don't have custody. You're turned into a visitor. You're, you've turned into like a, a babysitter who occasionally watches the kid, but ultimately has to defer to the final decision making of the real parent is how it currently works. So changing the system to be a system of one of presumed shared parenting with exceptions for abuse, neglect, or failure to provide specifically 
that's going to reduce the murders of fathers for starting. The second thing that's going to reduce the murders of fathers that we will see is when we finally start punishing the failure to comply with a parenting time and custody schedule the same way we do as delinquent child support. As soon as we start punishing those things equally or equitably even, the murders will go down. The problems will go down. Because as of right now, if a man in Michigan falls below his child support by even as low as $400, if he doesn't at least call child support to warn them or explain his situation, it will be assumed that he is avoiding it on purpose. He will immediately lose his driver's license. Uh, a warrant may be placed for his arrest. Over $400. Yet, when a mom refuses to allow the child to go on their court-ordered weekend or their court-ordered spring break schedule, what have you, which happens all the time, obviously, there's, there's really no states or counties that actually enforce the crime of custodial interference. Every once in a blue moon, in Texas, it's always Texas, you'll actually see a woman arrested for keeping the kids from the dad. But by and large, if you try to report custodial interference, police will show up and tell you it's a civil matter. They're not going to do anything. You could say, I'm the sole custodial father, and when I dropped our son off for a routine visit, mom took him and left state. What can you do? The police officers will tell you nothing. We recommend you file a motion of contempt of court. That'll show her. It's a joke. It's a joke. And so n no one's holding people accountable to actually follow any rules. To this day, family court is basically the wild, wild west. It's crazy to actually get anything done here. But. I just, I have to wonder what more we could have done to prevent this. Because sadly, as I'm thinking about it. Yeah, someone said, no, that's kidnapping. Unfortunately, it's not. Even though parental kidnapping is a crime in all 50 states, just like marital rape is a crime in all 50 states because, just because you're the parent doesn't mean you can't kidnap. Just because you're the husband or the wife doesn't mean you can't assault your spouse. Okay, it's illegal in all 50 states for a reason. It's just not being enforced at all. And Shanna knew she couldn't get away with that. She knew she couldn't get away with just taking the kids and leaving because Jared at least had enough money to fight her on that. He at least was going to prevent her from doing that. And I just, it really worries me because I'm, I'm saying all these things, these things are going to prevent murders, these things are going to prevent murders, but like, ultimately, when people have money, they're able to override these things because... Even if we did live in a world where you can't keep the kids from the other one or else you'll be punished and you have to share custody or else you'll be punished, the people who have the means to veto that custody through murder, they're gonna do it. So now our job becomes... We have to get justice then. We have to start showing justice in these cases because nothing else is going to scare away these people. But as long as the Shanna Gardeners of the world are seeing the 
God, what was the ex-wife of Chad Reed's name? I'll say it. Chad Reed ex-wife. What was that? Ho's name. Why is it not just readily appearing on here? Whatever her name was, I already forgot it. But as long as the Shannas of the world and the ex-wives of Chad Reed of the world are looking at these cases and seeing women get away with, in one way or another, be it an accident or something that looked like an accident, the more they see these women get away with this shit, the more they're like, that could be me, right? Really, I mean, there are so many women in this world, I'm confident, where if they knew that they could get away with having their ex totally removed from the picture, absolutely they'd do it. I think it was Christina. It was Christina Reed. Thank you for that. Most people don't understand that very few judges will order 50-50 and will often question it if both parents agree to it. That's absolutely true. Because what does a judge have to gain from awarding 50-50? You may be thinking, oh, happier societies, more equitable parenting solutions. No, no, no. What does the judge have to gain from ordering 50-50? Come on, people. We already know that 3 to 10% of child support gets cut back as a check back to the state. We all know that. We're not still foolish about that, are we? So if you've got sole custody being the main way custody is awarded in court, that leaves one person who is paying child support and one who isn't. That's great. Now notice this is so, like these judges are so unable to even try to contribute to a narrative that they're not being absolutely bought out that even when fathers are awarded 50-50, they still order child support. Like they're not even trying to hide it. They're really not. <laughs> it's crazy and that's why we need to like we need to quite frankly make examples of these people I'm so sick of these women getting away with it all the time because they're able to con some simp into doing their dirty work for them like again this Tenon guy I understand that he pulled the trigger. I understand that he is single-handedly the one responsible for physically killing Jared. And yet, I am like the least mad at that dude. Because we all know, we all know in our hearts that was not, he. this man would not have just woken up on a Wednesday morning and said, you know what might be a f an absolute thrill, just a joy and delight, something I just ain't never done before. Let's just kill a random guy. Let's just trap a dude into getting out of his car on a dark road and uh, let's just kill him in the kawinky dink of it being the same guy that my landlord wanted dead? Small world, what can I say? That dude probably had a million and one other problems that led to his involvement in this. And that's, that's the thing too, is why I also 
you know, as much as he's the, not really the main person I'm angry at, I really don't have forgiveness for that man because of the two-year-old in the car. Uh, and I know that that sounds weird with me saying it because it's almost like I would have forgiveness if it was just a grown-up he harmed, but you you know what I mean. I actually do want to read you guys the Stampin' Up! press release. Because it's so sickening, and I just think that Stampin' Up! deserves to be dragged as much as possible. Stampin' Up! addresses arrest. Where is... I think I saved the article. Thanks for hanging out with me while I attempt to find it. Where is it? Here we go. The reason that this stamping up press release is so disgusting is because they're they're trying to contribute to a false narrative within this. So this was, I don't even know how people got their hands on this, uh, but someone leaked this email sent internally to Stampin' Up's staff um, shortly after the arrest of Mario Fernandez. And it reads, as a Stampin' Up! leader, we feel it's important to communicate with you regarding a Gardner family matter. Stampin' Up! is aware that Mario Fernandez, Shanna Gardner's current husband, and notice, by the way, that suddenly her name is changed from Shanna Gardner Fernandez to, it's just Shanna Gardner now. We're just going to entirely drop off her entire government name, and we're just going to back it up, reel it back in here to just being a gardener, just as an extra little separation. Look, Shanna learns her narcissistic tools from the best, guys. Don't worry. Shanna, Shelley, and Sterling's daughter, and Mario have been separated for an extended period of time. We have no further details about the situation other than what has been reported by the media. Really? Yeah, that's just so easy to believe. That you know nothing outside of the media? That you're learning the details of this case as we are? Sure, Stampin' Up! Sure. We understand that some demonstrators have received troubling comments about this matter on their social media platforms. Please feel free to delete comments of an inappropriate nature and block and report those commenters on your personal accounts. You may also share this email with your teams if needed. Stampin' Up's long-standing commitment to you and all of our demonstrators is unwavering. Thank you for your continued concern and support. Sincerely, Stampin' Up. So within this little email that we've sent out, it's, it's such a clean-up email. It's such disgusting corporate damage control. It's, whoa, 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 you might have heard some people getting a little angry at us because of this tiny little hiccup where we may or may not have directly or indirectly financially contributed to the brutal murder of an innocent father. You might have heard a little something about that. Well, if you did, the thing you're going to want to do is, you know, our sweet, our sweet Shanna. She she doesn't even talk to that guy anymore. She, They haven't even, like, talked in, like, three days. So just what you're going to want to do is just forget about it. Block those pesky spam. Ugh, that's so yucky for the social media. Make sure you keep boosting the happy comments, okay? That's the main thing we're focusing on right now is just 
down playing the bad stuff. I think they also just, re like, right before the arrest, started pushing for, like, other media celebrations. Oh my god, it is an MLM. You're right, whoever said that in the chat... This is an MLM because, oh my God, yeah, they're doing the same thing all the MLMs do. They just celebrated their 10-year anniversary. Oh, wait, this was in 2019, so I might have been looking at an, an old one. But no, it's still, wait, what? Oh, I see what it is. That was their 10 years. So it seems like it's the thing to do is if you're part of the MLM, you're going to want to start a blog and they're going to coach you on what kinds of things to, to post in your blog. And a 10 year anniversary seems to be one of those things. You see this a lot in MLMs as they'll always have you like doing the same kinds of things. They'll be like, Oh, make sure that you are emailing 100 people a day and make sure that you are working the sales into big life events. Oh, you'll, what you'll want to do is talk about things like your trauma. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That's a real thing. Where is their official website? Stampin' Up. Do they have stock? No, they don't. I was like, how's the stock go doing? Is it going down? Find a demonstrator. Let me tell you, if you do find a Stampin' Up! demonstrator, I usually, I just said this in one of my last lives, like I'm not typically the kind of person to like raise a call to action, but like you should harass Stampin' Up! demonstrators. I hate to say it. Not like illegally harassing them but like I guess like it, in the way that I'm saying harass is more facetiously like when I say harass I mean you should definitely make them if they are not already aware of what the company they're working for is desperately attempting to cover up you should <laughs> what did I miss oh nothing just almost the entire live <laughs> but don't worry that's why we make it able to go back and watch this all over and as usual with these lives after the fact I'll be going in chopping it up editing it up so that it's nice and watchable for everyone who wasn't here for all of it all you need to know is if you're just getting here is that Shanna Gardner Fernandez is a piece of shit Mario Fernandez is a piece of shit Shelly and Sterling Gardner are a piece of shit the entire company stamping up stamping up they're all pieces of shit they need to be deplatformed and they need to go bankrupt so that no one else can fund any more fucking murder for hires within this family that's apparently trying to compete with the Murdaws. Okay? That's what you missed. <laughs> Truly, ask them if they enjoy working for murderers. That's your only job if you ever see a Stampin' Up! demonstrator. Oh, snap. It looks like Illuminati did a deep dive on the MLM pieces of Stampin' Up! for those interested. Who is that? Is he on Instagram? Or I said he. I don't even know. Illuminati actually sounds like it could be a woman. Naughty Stampin' Up! Let me see if I find whatever you're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Her. I do. I have seen her stuff before. And yeah, she does cover a lot of MLM stuff. You're right. Did she cover them before or after the murders? I'm curious. I have so many tabs open right now. I gotta close out of these five million tabs. Look, I was ready for this live, okay? Illuminati. Stampin' Up. Is it the rubber stamp MLM who wants full control of you? Oh, there's some other ones. Hold on, I'll show you guys what I'm looking at. There's a few people who've... I didn't have any... Why I left Stampin' Up! five months ago. I left Stampin' Up! two years ago. Do I regret it? Oh no, not Shen Yan. I refuse to listen to... <laughs> to that truth. 
How long is this one? 23 minutes. Do I have time to watch it with you guys? And are you guys down for such things? Oh my God, it's already almost two o'clock. Wow, we've been talking about this for a while. So it was before all this happens, but in the description, she mentions it specifically. Well, shoot, I got time today. If you guys want to watch this with me, I say let's watch it. But first, I have been live for like three hours without peeing. Um, sorry, two hours without peeing. But that's still longer than I'd like to go. So we're going to take a tiny little potty break. And then we're going to come back and we are going to watch Illuminati's coverage on Stampin' Up! as an MLM. Once again, because I am fully committed to shitting on and dragging Stampin' Up! with every fiber of my body. Because we can't bring Jared back, but we can bring the Gardner Empire the fuck down. So with that, we're going to take a little bathroom break, little potty break, and then I will be right back to roasting the shit out of these rich people. One sec. And we are back. And it wouldn't be a stream without the Dadvocat. Okay? I was like, wait a minute. It's almost been an entire live stream. And we did not get a single visit from the mochiest boy? Illegal. Can you please purr into the microphone for everybody? He seems like genuinely curious about it, though. T tell everybody here 
what a what a sweet boy you are, Mochi. The sweetest of boys. <laughs> I'm rewinding for what I missed. Will someone tell me when she's live again? Oh yeah, I'm here. I'll give you a second to catch up. <laughs> so that we can we won't start without you. Oh my god, I'm so happy I have a cat on my lap right now. You're such a good mochi boy. We're going to watch some MLM. He's only two. Um, he's our newest cat. We had a couple of sisters before we got him. Um, and those were my husband's cats when I met him. When I met my husband, I had, uh, he lived to be 18, but I had an older fluffy cat. Me, I'm back. <laughs> but I had an older male cat named Romeo. Um, when he passed away, I actually screen printed this lucky cat and painted it to look like him. Uh, he was like my best cat. I had him for a really long time. And then I didn't have a, uh, have a pet for a really long time after that. Um, I got Romeo when I was 18 years old and I had never adopted an animal after him. So about three years after his passing, I got kind of the bug. I got like the bug for wanting another boy cat. I tried to satiate the bug by getting a spider. Um, that only opened up my world to loving spiders, but not quite the same as having a big fat boy cat. Uh, it's just a little bit different. And so we went and checked out some cats at a feral center uh, he happened to be found on a bridge near where we live. Um, and I knew that he was the one because my five-year-old went right up to him and just picked him up like the, like a big fat hot dog or something. And he just started purring. He loved it. And he just let her like manhandle the shit out of him. <laughs> and he was being so chill. And I was like, that's the one. He's fat enough. He's chill enough. I want a fat, chill cat. And so that's what I have on my lap now. So now that I've talked about my cat enough, I feel that we probably have everybody here. Um, I have a question, a, a technical troubleshooting question before we really start. Um, in a past, in the past, it sounded almost like my microphone and listening on here we're causing some audio issues. So I just want to do a little Free test. Gifts with code MLM16 at HelloFresh.com slash MLM16. Now, this may be weird, but I never versus... expected to begin an episode talking about the term rubberhead and stampaholic. When I first found it, I immediately assumed it referred to some sort of offensive slur, but here we are. Okay, did it sound better when I turned the microphone off? Was there less, uh, I don't know if reverb's the right word, or like feedback? Um, it sounds louder when you're muted. Hmm, louder when I'm muted. I wonder if like the way that I have it set up is it's fighting itself. Um, but does it is it a problem if I have them both on at the same time? Like, does it and sound no, weird? No, for the record, it's not in reference. To Are you looking for a... I might have to start wearing headphones. I found the lot sound levels good across the live. Okay. Video audio is much louder than the mic. That's true. I will definitely lower it down a bit. Okay. Stress -free summer. How does this step -step video audio and fresh pre sound to make meal with times my voice. a summer breeze? Get 16 free Doesn't meals plus weird. three free gifts with cool. code MLM16 at HelloFresh.com slash MLM16. Now, this, over. this may be weird, but I never expected to begin an episode talking about the term rubberhead and stampaholic. When I first found it, I immediately hey. assumed it referred to some sort of offensive slur, but here we are. And no, for the record, it's not in reference to that. Stamping is a creative hobby that is just as straightforward as it sounds. Enthusiasts use stamping materials to make a decorative imprint on a variety of surfaces. 
There are rubber stamps, clear stamps, and metal stamps, as far as I know, but there could be more. What draws people into this hobby is the versatility of surfaces. Wrapping paper, cakes, and clothing are just some of the canvases for people to express themselves artistically. This oh, activity sprang into popularity around the year 2000, and many companies have capitalized on its market. So there should be no surprise here that I've thought about doing that shit as a mom. Like they really sell you on that stuff, especially because like women are so susceptible in their earliest years of motherhood because it's like early on in their marriage and they're still trying to be like the dream housewife who always has the surfaces wiped down and the the living room is always a magnificent presentable and to the top of interest and pin or Pinterest and Instagram standard. Uh, they really, like, you're so susceptible in that timeline where you're, like, convincing yourself you have to do everything right as a mother and a new wife that you're so likely to buy these stupid little kits where you can, like, customize your kid's name and, like, stamp their name on every single one of their clothes that they're outgrowing at an insane and, like, crazy rate. But then, like, you think about it as a reasonable person who doesn't necessarily have to constantly present themselves as a perfect Pinterest or Instagram mom. And you remember, oh yeah, my kid is growing at an exponential rate. And if I stamp their stupid name on every freaking article of clothing, I'm not really going to be able to hand these down to anybody who doesn't have the exact same name as my kid, or I'm not going to be able to resell these if I want to. So it's just, it it's actually kind of dumb. I mean, I guess stamps can come off, but then that makes it even stupider because then you're, you have to stamp your kid's clothes constantly every time you wash them. No, thank you. It also has an MLM attached to it. Stampin' Up! And yes, with the exclamation point. I did notice they tried to make themselves the victim. Was founded in 1988 Hold on. By I forgot to read. <laughs> That's such a great creepy picture of her. This is the cringe we should all be thinking about when we think of Shelly's bitch ass. I've also been calling her Sherry this whole time, I just now realized. And I don't care. I don't care. You deserve to just have your name absolutely destroyed. What does she have to say about it? Because I know she added a... Someone said she added an addendum or a note in the description, but actually... It doesn't say anything. I don't think she's actually addressed the latest... Let me check chat. Didn't one of you guys say she actually said something in the description about it? Does Illuminati know? She has to know. My sisters, Shelly Gardner and LaVon Crosby. These women were highly involved in a number of direct marketing companies after marrying their husbands and moving to the Las Vegas area. One of them notably was Tupperware. The sisters were introduced to rubber stamping and fell Uncle in love with Rico it. Shelly wanted to be a distributor, but the sisters didn't like the sales approach of existing companies. She and LaVon thought, if we can't find the right company, why don't we just make one? Soon they had their business. Oh, and I get Stampin it. Up Thanks for clarifying. Totally grew. I need to stop doing that. That's going to sound terrible if I do this the entire episode, but it has an exclamation mark after it. And I just feel like you got to be a little jazzy with it or something, you know? <laughs> well, they opened up a number of distribution centers and became one of the largest stamping outlets out there. LaVon Crosby left the company in 1998 and oddly, she's nowhere to be found on the company information. And that's so much creepier now. <laughs> I thought they were going to say, and oddly, she's nowhere to be found. I'm like, you might want to look into that a little bit more now. <laughs> I find that really weird. Like, it's like she never existed unless you dig deep. It doesn't truly have much impact on the topic as far not, as the MLM quality. Not that quality, surprising. But her absence is strange since she was literally one of the founders. Now, when you look at the background, it only says the company was founded by two sisters, and it makes me wonder why there's such a deliberate effort to leave one sister out of the story. The reported version for Crosby leaving the business was to focus on- As it would turn out, Stampin' Up! became very good at leaving things out of stories. Her family. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but the whole shtick of MLMs is supposedly giving you the flexibility to do both, so I find that just a little odd. Now, Shelly's daughter, Sarah, is now the CEO. The founder stepped down in 2015 to serve in a Mormon mission with her husband. And I know we've gone over the Mormon church and everything before, but it's interesting that followers are part of yet another MLM. Now, fortunately, or- I know I'm pausing a lot, but this is another thing that's really interesting to me 
is the involvement of both of these families in the Mormon church. I've been really hesitant to get too into my opinions on all of it just because I don't know if Jared's widow or the people who love Jared are still involved in the Mormon church or the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, I don't know if it's still like a close part of their lives and it may be disrespectful for me to speak of the religion, especially if the their children are still involved in it. Um, I will say, as being as vague as possible, I certainly have my own opinions that are pretty judgmental um, about the church and a lot of the history of abuse within here. Um, that being said, we did hear earlier how Shanna was trying to step away from the Mormon church and kind of remove herself from it. She wasn't really interested in it anymore. And that being said, I'm just curious what that means to her parents. If maybe her parents are using all of this to try to get her to come back to the church, that maybe if the church has her back on this, that maybe they'll be able to buy her loyalty back into it or something like that. The Mormon church is very powerful. It's eerily powerful. And they really look out for those who choose to stick with all the terrifying and invasive rules, quite frankly. You will be rewarded within the church if you choose to stay this is where we hear about, like, a lot of fathers divorcing Mormon women. The the Mormon women will be fully funded by the church in the divorce. Th they do that regularly. If you prove your loyalty to them, they will have your back. Unfortunately, depending how you want to look at this, the family being Mormon doesn't actually appear to have any impact on the business itself, which seems to be good. On the surface, it appeared that Stampin' Up, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do it the whole time, Stampin' Up had a major impression. But in the past 10 years, their representatives have been leaving in droves. Why I left Stampin' Up, I, I tried to contain myself there, but why I left Stampin' Up is the title of many videos and articles. There is a major issue with the company and it's driving away their sellers and bringing up some legal trouble. Yes. Hello and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati and today we're gonna to be talking about the Stampin' Up MLM. God help me, this whole episode, I am just gonna be completely unhinged about this. Of course, with it being in direct sales, you know that not everything is rosy and bright. So put yourself in the shoes of one of the MLM sellers for just a moment here. You're browsing the web, looking for potential inspiration for your next designs, and soon you find images that look oddly familiar. They are the same designs that you sell, and they even have your company's name, but they aren't allegedly your product. Well, that's no. what happened to Stampin' Up! as they sued Alibaba and a number of Alibaba's affiliates. Oh, Number I thought we were going to find out that Stampin' Up! was plagiarizing. I don't care that they were plagiarized, though. Independent sellers were accused of selling knockoff versions of their stamps, listing them in English with U.S. prices and U.S. shipping. Wu Yu, K L J U Y P, uh, and if that's. How dang you, it. I don't like Stampin' Up being the victim of anything because they're the kinds of people who will use being the victim of anything to make them the victim of everything. If that's a word that you pronounce, I cannot pronounce that. Cool Hool and Liang Shang Mei and a number of others were docked on the ticket. Alibaba was held responsible for not moderating the potential counterfeit. And I think you guys know how I feel about copyright. With technology the way it is, what we create is so ingrained in our ability to provide for ourselves and our loved ones. This is something that pretty much everyone knows, but I think I wanna spell it out anyway. If you take someone's material for your own gain, you are almost literally taking money out of their pocket and food out of their mouth. It's such a rampant issue due to, in part, the fact that creativity itself is so highly marketable and is so easily accessible. But put a pin on this bit of information because we will return to it later on. Now, this lawsuit against Alibaba is indirectly involved with why Stampin' Up! has so many consultants quitting their jobs. There are a number of YouTube pages, blogs, Reddit threads, tweets, and more talking about the state of the company, why they are leaving, and what's next for them in their stamping careers. 
I normally don't use a lot of these smaller sources because they don't typically get vetted for reliability, but I do. I feel like that's a really big deal too, because most of the time, like, I think people leave jobs. Sorry, I didn't mean for that to wiggle so much. Um, I, th I feel like people leave jobs fairly often. Um, depending on like what kind of field you're in, you may actually be switching jobs like every three to five years because it's the only way to grow in your field. So switching jobs pretty often, I don't think that any of that is too abnormal, but what you don't really see very often is when a person quits their job for them to make an entire YouTube video about why they quit their job that's when you know it's bad because most of us like even in like bad jobs right I've definitely left some like crappy jobs that didn't treat me right and paid like shit and most of them you just leave you move on for these people to feel so strongly about their experience within the company that they not only quit but they went out of their way to record and share videos warning others not to make the same mistakes as them. Do you find that they are important to hear? Now, what I found in them are recurring themes, enough that little drops of evidence result in a sweeping river. One of the primary reasons that many have left the company has actually little to do with the company itself. Crap happens, life happens, right? Whether there's an unexpected move or a passing in the family, there are times when Yikes. we all have to put the business aside and tend to what's really important in life. A number of former Stampers share their personal story and how they felt like- Dude, how much you guys want to bet that Stampin' Up! is going to use this whole controversy too to like sell their stuff too? Like, you know what's been so great about this for Shanna is between an unexpected passing of her ex and, you know, her unfortunately having to lose out on that child support, which I can, I'm sure you can imagine has been very hard on our daughter, and then unexpectedly having to move so that she can distance herself from from her husband who very much murdered her ex-husband, she's still able to have the freedom to keep working thanks to Stampin' Up. <laughs> Leaving was the best Love decision. those glasses though. I listened to a number of these women's stories and something just kept bugging me about it. There is never a point where I read or hear Stampin' Up has been really supportive through my ordeal. And look, I understand that companies don't really have an obligation to help their people through hardships or situations, barring things like maternity leave and medical stuff, but it's still widely considered an expectation. I would say that counts for this MLM especially, considering that their past webpage claimed, Shelly and her sister envisioned the company working much like a family where each demonstrator could participate at whatever level worked best for her personal circumstance. Families are generally expected to lend a hand. Yeah, as long as you're still giving me something, in I find my this wallet. omission of the company's role in those hardships really odd. What assumption can be made other than the probability of the company adding on stress? Their current claim is that their desire to make a positive difference in people's lives is like that's what they're working with right now. In almost every case, though, they're a glaring no show for the ones who left. Just like most other MLMs, Stampin' Up! largely markets to women. The majority of the website features pictures of women, and while men also enjoy hobbies like stamping, and women are equally capable of excelling in, you know, other non-stamping careers, <laughs> they still appear to operate under the stereotype of stay-at-home moms looking to make money. Stampin' Up!, per the norm, gives the facade of empowering women when it does the opposite. It's all the more reason to call them out on their lack of presence when times are tough. Yes. Like other reasons sellers are leaving, it's directly attributed to the MLM policies. Like I said before, Stampin' Up! is extremely protective of their material, and I fully understand why. However, it's taken oh, yeah. too far when it comes to- They were pissed that people leaked that email that demonstrators leaked the email. And it would not surprise me if people literally lost their jobs at Stampin' Up! over sharing that email policies directed at their sellers. It's not like sellers are trying to copy their products like what Alibaba did. A scrapbooking blog reported in September of 2009 that Stampin' Up! updated their no-compete clause. And again, there's initially no problem with a non-compete. Especially in a creative outlet, it does make some sense. There are just two rules, however, that are literally driving their own sellers away. I'm taking these rules directly from that policy booklet. Representatives may not 
sell any competitive products or services as listed above through electronic communications, including email, social networks, blogs, or websites. The next one Whoa. is also a restriction. So what do you think that means? Any competitive product... So that could be as little as like, well, yeah, you're selling our stamps, so like, please don't sell any stamps, which is pretty normal um, as far as uh, business policies go and conflicts of interest. But like, do you think that could go so far as to say like any competitive product? Like, or like, even if they're just selling something else, like if in addition to Stampin' Up, they also want to like sell protein shakes or whatever. I'm curious. They can't participate in affiliate programs or be compensated for affiliate links to competitive products, competitive categories of products, or competitive companies on blogs, videos, social media, or other online forums. Okay, so it is not very Demonstrators vague. also may not monetize their personal or sites specific. or Stampin' Up sales vague. through affiliate programs. Now, I want to stress these two rules because they are deeply involved with the sellers. If they have a website, they can only sell Stampin' Up! products, and they're playing watchdog over your electronic communications and a website if you have one. From what I've seen, there are a lot of sources for stamping, and people are naturally creative folks. They want to mix and match products. They want to experiment and express themselves. This MLM actively prevents their sell- Real quick, uh, Daniel, the full Stampin' Up! email is earlier in the video. Uh, don't worry about it now. Um, but it was probably, like, if you can remember any timestamps, like, roughly 15 minutes ago, I want to say, that we read it. But it is in the video. We did go over it. Sellers from being the artistic force they are by saying, you can only use this product brand. These rules and all others listed also apply to spouses, whether or not they work for Stampin' Up. So if you have a husband or wife who wants to work with another stamping company, too damn bad. <laughs> All competitive activities, guidelines, and exclusions apply to both a demonstrator and their spouse, regardless of whether or not the spouse is, that is even a supporting legal? demonstrator. Regardless of if you're the only seller. Hold on, is that legal? If you join a company for them to put policies on your spouse who doesn't even work for them? What? They are just as much employed as you are. And to that note, it's a bit of a slap in the face to the whole self-empowerment idea they try to sell. You know, the whole own your own business and be your own boss rhetoric. These sellers are supposed to be their own professional entity. They should have the right to feature whatever items they want, if that's accurately what's going on here. Now, I do understand some of their rules. I don't expect them to accept other items being sold at their events, but you know, what someone wants to do in their own time is like their own business, especially if you aren't paying them. And I have never, ever seen a rule where it extends to your spouse. I don't yeah. even know if that is, like, something that can be held up legally. Right. It's, Sorry. it's so incredibly strange. I've never seen something like this before. But, of course, these are supposed to be business owners. And, you know, I'm no, you know, little smarty pants here, but um, I thought part of a business owner thing is having autonomy over your own business, not having someone above you control you and control your spouse's creative activities. But, okay. The severe no-compete types of rules are stifling as well, and it's other primary reasons why people leave this MLM. It would be one thing if the stamps and accessories were exceptional, but it's been reported this year that many reps are even disappointed with a selection. Personally, I don't have a lot of experience with stamping, so I couldn't give you a professional opinion regarding the quality of their stamps or a judgment of the art. I can only make conclusions based on those who have the experience with them. So let's go ahead and take a look at that MLM model and see, are these limitations worth it to get in the circle? Pro tip, they aren't. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Let's assume for some reason the idea of stamping and crafting really inspired someone and they wanted to get into it. They spent a fun night making fun items with friends. They joined the family and get hit with one hell of an entry fee, $99. Now, of course, they're gonna get the typical pitch. Oh, you are getting so much more value than $99. It's really a steal. And when they say it's a steal, you have to always wonder who's actually doing the stealing. One of the claims they make right? is that they're giving you all the things you need to run your own business. But we just uncovered the fact that it isn't really their business, and especially not with all of those rules and clauses attached. It doesn't seem like much, but keep in mind that most of the sales reps and MLMs don't make enough money to support themselves. We've gone over it at nauseum, but Correct. just so you know that this one is not unique. 
chances are that the $99 for the investment won't be recouped, just statistically speaking. Now, that being said, the entry cost isn't what gets them roped in. It's the cost of maintaining the status. In order to stay with the MLM, a seller has to earn 300 CSV or consumer sales value, which is honestly an unnecessarily fancy way yeah. to say $300. If a person doesn't make their sales in a month, they are put on probation where they either have to earn that money or get kicked out. Now keep in mind that some of these demonstrators are depending on that income. And again, this initially doesn't seem too perilous, but then a we seller can't has live to on it, all but the we expenses depend on involved it. with setting up a show. There's the cost of renting a venue if said seller needs a place to do the show. They also have to pay the price for advertising online, run and maintain their own website, pay for all the classes and products to use the business, all the stationery and pay for gas, which honestly is probably insane now. And these are just the basic costs of running your own business in this capacity. So wow. it isn't really that unfamiliar. Chances are, you know a business owner who deals with these types of things. But the main difference is that they may have a legitimate autonomy over all of their stuff. And you stack all these expenses together and then you'll make the bare minimum wage on sales and voila, we have the MLM model. Realistically speaking, if someone wants to stay out of the red as a Stampin' Up! owner, they would need to make anywhere between I want to read this comment from your awesome 55. There is no way this MLM isn't also violating tax laws by misclassifying their employees as independent contractors. Dude, it's like double talk and rhetoric is the Gardner family staple. 600 to 800 dollars. Now they'll tell you, of course, that you can make that easily, but by now we know again that the numbers don't lie and the numbers do not agree with that statement. Like the majority of other MLMs, Stampin' Up! got in trouble with the FTC regarding bogus claims made during oh. the pandemic. They received the same cease and desist order as all the rest. One of the income claims that was shot down highlighted an accomplishment made by one of their sellers who brought in over a million dollars. Now the other one was a bit more deceitful. A seller reached out to her friends talking about how to get them something for free would result in her getting her car paid off. Another encouraged people to sign up because it was a cheap and easy business investment. And I feel like I have to say this every time because it just keeps coming up. Trying to thrive and make a living off an MLM job is not easy and it no. certainly isn't quick cash. The chances of succeeding in this type of business is astronomically low. And there are people out there who will try to convince you otherwise, but you always have to be on guard with these things. Yep. And you know, most of the time they make these claims because they want you to join and become their downline. It's always about money. The company doesn't require their reps to recruit, but there's always the lure of earning more. There are always going to be people out there who are willing to sell you or your loved ones out for some extra cash. There was a reason I always stress that mm -hmm. people put their relationships at risk when joining an MLM. By now, people have figured out when they're getting used or being seen as just another dollar in someone else's wallet or purse. It breaks their trust and calls their friendship into question. And you better believe that they're- And it's so, awkward how like personal some of these people get when they're deep in like the MLM life and when so many of their accomplishments are contingent on their downlines succeeding. This is where it gets really ugly within families and MLMs is because, you know, someone's aunt will get them involved with it and then they'll get their cousin in on it. And now the aunt, her big trip to Mexico is contingent on her niece making sure that her two cousins stay in on it. So she needs to go to Mexico. She's gonna be putting the pressure on her niece to make sure those cousins don't go anywhere. Now niece is putting the pressure on her cousins and that's gonna just cut up so many holes in in this family, okay? It's gonna cause a lot of different problems. It's not just a pyramid of money at the top flowing down, as some people try to make it, or money at the bottom building up all the money at the top. It's also resentment at the bottom spreading its way throughout the whole pyramid and from the top down as well. The pressure going down, the resentment going up, It. There's a lot more that's being built into this pyramid than just some people making money. It really does fuck up families. There is an upline downline hierarchy here. There's a bronze, bronze elite, silver, silver elite. Gold, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a damn minute. They just said 
that one CSV is equivalent to one dollar. So you're telling me that if I sell ten thousand dollars worth of stuff, I get a pen? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> platinum and Platinum Elite. And you can tell we're really just pushing the edge of creativity here with these names. Oh my God. Chat just says, Daniel goes, when my youngest daughter was going through chemo, I posted about being stressed and putting on some weight. This prompted a former friend, love to read that, to start targeting me for Shakeology. Dude, the bitches that target you for Shakeology are so cutthroat, too. That is far from the first one time I've heard about this. And I'm not going to lie. I've actually, like, I actually do have some Shakeology in my house because, <laughs> because I've definitely ended up getting some. Like, like, if you like it, you like it. But, like, it's a totally different thing to say, like, oh, if you like meal replacement shakes, this might be good for you right? Which is how I ended up getting some ages ago. But what these people do is they don't do it like that. They don't say, oh, if you like meal replacement shakes, you might like this. They go, hey, I heard that you were expressing one of your deepest insecurities. I'd like to monetize on that. <laughs> That's always the way it goes. I've heard of Shakeology people targeting people two weeks after they gave birth. I've heard of them targeting people when they gained weight after losing a spouse. They don't care. They come for you in your deepest state of insecurity. And that's when they want to sink those vampiric teeth in and suck you out for all they can. Now, the more demonstrators or sellers you have under your belt, the higher the ranking is, not to mention the more that has to be sold. There is even the annual incentive program, which is a trip to Alaska with hundreds of other demonstrators. Okay, so it's not Mexico. The person who blogs about the trip gushes about how much they enjoyed it, but there's no claim of them paying for the flight or the cruise. It would not surprise me at all if the cruise was just another training program meant to indoctrinate the sellers even more. For MLMs as a whole, I don't understand the idea of squeezing every penny out of the people around you. With all these expenses listed, you can absolutely work nonstop around the clock and maybe make a vision come true. But more often than not, it's going to be vital for a demonstrator to recruit as many bodies as possible. They, of course, will get a chunk out of the pie and quite a bit towards their quota. And this goes into one of the other reasons that demonstrators are leaving. They're simply getting burned out from the intense grind that Stampin' Up! created through their requirements. There is a lot of pressure to make sales, and as one former demonstrator said, there is no stop to the grind. The very moment that circumstances get difficult, this MLM becomes overwhelming. It's hard to imagine owning your own business, having all sorts Congrats, of expenses, Daniel. having all that stress, and lacking true agency in what you do. That's awesome. Stampin' Up! stifles the very thing that it prioritizes as a company, creativity. What's even more frustrating is the possibility that, for all the rules this MLM pushes, they may not practice what they preach. And before we get into that frustrating reality, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. Those big wireless Sorry. providers forget that families come in. Scooch past this one. A business cell phone. We all have Mint Mobile plans for all of our work phones, and we're just all under one family, so it's really. Knows that you're more than just your credit score. So rather. <laughs> MLM. Ah, uh, another lawsuit. We've talked about how Stampin' Up! had a standing lawsuit against Alibaba for alleged copyright infringement, or counterfeiting, depending on how you want to see it. Now, that began in 2018. The following year, in 2019, the MLM was actually on the receiving end of a lawsuit from a company called My Sweet Petunia. My Sweet Petunia founded three patents codenamed 531, 812, and Get up, Petunia. respectively. Each trademark was legally issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office with corresponding dates listed. Points 12 through 14 go into detail about each one of the patents, pointing out specific details about the intellectual properties. The individual patent list of rubber stamps with specific grid lines, workspace, a specific number of magnets, and a certain number of measurements that set them apart from others were all details that were listed and important details to note. 
The stamps also have a number of accessories specific to each product. This was allegedly to make the stamping process more steady and consistent. My Sweet Petunia makes the accusation essentially that Stampin' Up! copied the patent and created their own product, the Stamparatus, which, what a name. On November 14th, 2017, Petunia sent Stampin' Up! a cease and desist letter, the first cease and desist letter informing Stampin' Up! of the 531 patent and requesting that Stampin' Up! provide Petunia a sample of the Stamparatus. Oh, the they're month, like, the show, us, show us what you any trademark infringement made. And refusing to how, how about you uh, show us your little version here? Ooh, I love it. It's ruthless. I'm sorry. I do have to pee again, though. So um, we have to pause here in the middle of this other one. Give me just a sec. Okay, thanks for that, guys. I drank a lot of water, but I'm back, and I'm still gonna drink more water. <laughs> it's clear that the company believes that Stampin' Up! knowingly violated their legal rights. What strikes me as a bit strange here is the repeated refusal to cooperate with my sweet petunia in any fashion whatsoever. If the items were so different, wouldn't it just be easy to send over a sample of the Stamparatus and be like, look, they're not the same at all? There are already trademarks involved on both sides, so if My Sweet Petunia by chance were suspected of stealing the trademark, Stampin' Up! could simply turn around the lawsuit and financially hit the plaintiff even harder. Now it could be, for all distress they put on protecting their trademark, that Stampin' Up! actually does have something to hide. Could this be a company that really doesn't care about artistic integrity like they claim? Now, if Could it? Case, this MLM would be exposed as true hypocrites that only care about getting as much money as possible. Yes. I'm not saying they are or not. I'm just saying this is kind of shady. It's definitely a gray area. The fact that they kind of just were like, no, we're not participating in this lawsuit. Sorry, is there weird. we go. And I mean, yeah, they're an MLM. There's a certain reputation already there, and the reputation's not a good one. When it comes to the litigations that are ongoing, there are a lot of questions, but sadly, not really a lot of answers yet. So we are still waiting and watching. A smudged perception. Now the truth here is people I'll are leaving, say. lawsuits are ongoing, and the overall perception of Stampin' Up! has been in great decline. I truly feel for those who bought into the system and got repeatedly punished for wanting to explore all aspects of their creativity, because those are the people that really suffer here at the end of the day. When looking at this MLM and all the details demonstrators are forced through, it's shocking that anyone would humor them with their time, but that was apparently a thing for a while. It feels like what keeps them going is the promise of people who feel restrained, who want to create artistic outlets and express themselves. And it seems like stamping is a legitimately fun way to express themselves and, and just have a good time. I've actually seen some cool crafts and learned about how versatile stamping actually is by researching this and I was just surprised. I didn't know you could even do this much. Like, that's very cool. But as always, I want to stress caution when involving yourself with an MLM. MLMs in general yep. have a track record and it's a bit consistent in the shitty department. Yeah. So just know that it doesn't really matter what genre of activity this MLM is being involved in, whether it be stamps or supplements or whatever, they usually are not as great as they seem initially. And this is another case of that. In the meantime though, if you are someone who who enjoys stamping, then keep on at it. Make holiday cards and wrapping paper, design something cool on a shirt, or press a beautiful piece of nature to color. These are worthwhile things to do. If not for profit, at least, then just for yourself. Enjoy the work that you create. It's a shame that companies out there would and do take advantage of that. For financial freedom, for creative freedom, I'd recommend you avoid stamping up.
But hey, what do I know? I'm just a pyramid here on the internet. So those are just opinions, thoughts, and everything all wrapped up into a cute little bow of what is currently the state of Stampin' Up. That will be the end of today's episode. I do hope you learned something new here today. Good work, Illuminati. Fork them right up. It is funny too, like if you search Stampin' Up, I don't think there's anything good. Okay, there is. <laughs> Constant fear. Yeah, that's not gonna be great for their uh, little business there. Why I left. Some good, some good positive ones. Aw, poodles, you'll get out of there soon. Should we, like, dude, at this point, do we need to start letting Stampin' Up! members know? I mean, they already know. They're gonna, they, they had to send out this email to all of their demonstrators. Like, oh, you might have gotten some harassment. Poodles is hearing about it. There's no way she's not. I want to go in here and see if she's got anything on, like, her videos. Like, hey, Poodles, um... Do you know what they've done? Let's check these comments nine days ago. What? I bet. Do you think that she's uh, sticking with deleting the comments like they told her to? Because they're definitely in damage control mode. How many of these stamp people do you think? Let's see. Go to the top. Oh, that's that's the daughter herself Hi. in this one. Oh, these are only positive comments. Interesting. Wow, they're really monitoring, dude. They are not allowing any negative comments in. Oh, wow. Let's see, who else is a, is a stamp head here? Streamed three months ago? Wendy, yeah. you hearing about it yet? Wendy, no! She's deleting the comments too! Come on, Wendy. She's got a lot of subscribers. When, when was her last video? She's posting the shaz of six days ago. Comments? Nope. This is only positive. Dude, these Stampin' Up! bitches are really doing their PR, man. They're really helping protect this family. And, like, I feel bad, too, because it's, like, it's not Wendy's fault that her bosses are definitely involved uh, in a murder-for-hire plot, allegedly, in my opinion. Um, it's not her fault that now she's associated with... What's the word I'm looking for? I, I, I said earlier, a shamed company. Um, when a company is, like, humiliated and they've lost their reputation... Hey, babe! What's the word for, what is a company called when, like, the reputation is ruined? Like, the company is ashamed. They're a blank company. It's not defunct. Trump. Um, shit, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it's disgraced? Disgraced. That's the word. Thank you. You're welcome. My, that's my, uh, walking Jeopardy husband right there. Yeah, you now work for a very disgraced company. And I don't know what, like, what do you do if you're Wendy in this situation? And your whole life, you've built 38.9 thousand subscribers. That's pretty significant considering, like, I have overall a much larger platform than Wendy. I have 1.3 million on TikTok, over 100,000 on Facebook and Instagram. But here on YouTube, I, I only have 8,000 subscribers myself. So Wendy is blowing me out of the water with her stamps. In fact, she, she averages about as many views as I do. Uh, this is like her, her whole life. You know, are we expecting these people to just up and pick a new MLM? 
I don't know if it's going to necessarily be that easy because, again, I didn't even know that there was a stamping MLM. So I don't... I don't know if she'll be able to just, like, jump ship abruptly. This this is everything she does. If she does card classes. She seems to be really good at it. It's just that, unfortunately, now her channel and all channels associated with bringing money into Stampin' Up! is directly going to a family of murderers. I'm sorry. It, it's true. There's really no other MLM that is this bad at this point. Like, you look in all these other ones, you know, they may be selling crappy products for overpriced money. They may be trying to convince you to sell out your family members and other shady things. But at least... I can't think of any MLMs at the moment where I know that I'm going to be contributing financially to a bunch of murderers. What a terrible reputation to have. <laughs> Let's get into our final thoughts of the stream. Because we've been live for quite a while now. We've covered the entirety of the case from start to finish. From when Jared and Shanna met to when Shanna decided that she was going to absolutely just cheat on Jared and tear their family apart with some rando trainer dude from the gym that he paid for. Uh, apparently didn't like getting too embarrassed by that. All the way to it being discovered that Shanna's husband, Mario, was absolutely involved in paying off the murderer of Jared through three separate handwritten checks. Again, why is a landlord giving money to a man who would eventually kill his wife's ex-husband in the middle of a very contentious custody battle? At this point... A lot of questions remain, but I think we have our answers. At this point, all I can really do is hope for justice and call upon all of you to get the message out, share videos like these, share the story. I'll keep paying attention and seeing what I can update you all with. I love when people come in right at the end. Sorry, just joined what happened. Like three hours. I'm so sorry. The worst time to jump in. But it's not too late to just grab the little bar, just joint it back until the very beginning, and get started there. It's, it's great. So at this point, we know everything that there is to know. We're eagerly awaiting Mario Fernandez's um, trial to see if he's going to sell out Shanna, to see what more details will be revealed. I'm going to tell you guys this right now. I'm not going to be happy until Shanna's behind bars. That's what I want so badly in this world. Shanna Gardner Fernandez. None of us are going to shut up about this until you, bitch, are in jail. All right? On that note, I'm going to start getting out of here. I'm so happy I was able to share the story with you. Please go follow Justice for Jared B. on Instagram. That is Jared's now late wife and widow, Kirsten, who is doing a phenomenal job and will be keeping us all posted of absolutely every update until we see Shanna's dusty ass behind bars. On that note, I love you guys. You're awesome. I'm going to be providing so much more content for you. Visit my website, dadvocate.net, for any merch, blogs, updates. Go follow me on all the other stuff. Instagram, Facebook, TikToky. 
but this is going to be the main hub from now on. So I will see you all for more crazy stories like this. We're going to keep fighting for justice for dads till forever. Until soon.